Draft Mechanic is a proud member of Punchboard Media. Pull up a chair at punchboardmedia.com. Draft Mechanic, episode 80. On this episode of Draft Mechanic, it's time once again for the Gen Con hype list. We start with three hype-filled recent plays of Downforce Danger Circuit, Star Realms Frontiers, and Villainous, the last of which we're putting on tap. Then we go through the Gen Con preview and tell you what we're excited to see, play, and inevitably buy. We asked our Slack channel in the funnel round what they're excited about at Gen Con. So sit back, relax, grab a pint, and enjoy the show. You've seen the future and it works today. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Draft Mechanic. I'm Jake. And I'm Danielle. And Draft Mechanic is the podcast about board games and craft beer and anything we can do to tie the two together. Here at Draft Mechanic, we like our beer like we like our board games. Sometimes hype to the max is okay. Sometimes. 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 I think today, however, is a day that we are going to be diving deep into the hype. If you did not already know from the cover image or the name of the episode, this is the 2018 hype list. We're going to be, do- going to be doing our Gen Con preview. And, uh, I mean, we've kind of been talking about Gen Con being on the horizon since literally January when the tickets went on sale. Yeah. It's finally here. You know what I'm really excited about? Not talking about Gen Con Not after talking the next about episode? Gen Con for approximately two to three months. Because... <laughs> Oh boy, that's all we get anymore. Hey everybody, if this is your first episode of Draft Mechanic, thank you so much for joining us today. You can find us on the internet at draftmechanic.net or at Draft Mechanic on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all your typical social media places, draftmechanic at gmail.com as well if you want to shoot us an email, Danielle. We've also got a Board Game Geek Guild that is guild number 2470. There will be a thread up there for this episode and every episode and other cool little news bits that we get in there. Mm-hmm. So if you want to go over there and leave us your two cents on what we're talking about, what you're excited about about Gen Con, the <laughs> fact that you never want to hear about Gen Con again this is all okay (laughs) and draft mechanic is a member of punchboard media for all of the great audio written and video content creators of punchboard media go to punchboardmedia.com go check them out everybody did a gen con preview who is going to gen con and we are one of them so you can kind of just fill your entire ride with audio and well you can put the video on 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 video and just listen to the audio of the video while you go to gen con too i mean vans have tvs in the back now so as long as you're not the driver i think you can watch it right yeah absolutely that is totally okay if you happen to be in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, this is a non-Gen Con event I want to talk about. We are actually missing our normal bi-monthly meetup, our Good Road Cider Works meetup, which would normally be on the first Thursday of every month, because we're going to be at Gen Con. Surprise. Woo! But we are doing a really big event on the 12th of August, which is going to be the Draft Mechanic Great Big Board Game Day, which is going to be at Good Road Cider Works, just like the meetup would have been, from noon till close. That is a Sunday, so if you have normal weekends off, you should be able to go. And it is going to be a family-friendly event. They Mm -hmm. are a cidery, but they do have non-alcoholic beverages. They have snacks. It's a great well-lit, nice, friendly space. They've got lots of outdoor areas. If if that's your deal, you want to go outside. If it's you know, poor weather, which we cannot control. They have lots of indoor areas, too. So if you want to bring the whole family, we would love to see you play some games. We've got some giveaways. They've got a food truck coming. It's going to be great. Oh, yeah. I'm so excited for this. And hopefully we'll have some of that new Gen Con hotness that we talk about in this episode to play at that particular meetup. It is inevitable. That is, Yeah, there's going to be some stuff, and we'll get to that in a bit. At the top of the show here, I also wanted to give a shout out to our new micro badgers, people who have picked up the Draft Mechanic Board Game Geek micro badge. We have John Tyler and Matteo Rondi have picked that up as well. So thank you all to both of y'all for picking that up that micro badge and displaying it if you want the draft mechanic micro badge you can go to our guild it's guild 2470 on board game geek there is a thread in which you can ask for geek gold if you don't have it and if you do have it it's eight geek gold and it's a badge and it makes me feel really cool every time i see that number count go up a little bit so yeah that's a thing that you can do so in other show i guess related news uh if you want mm. to if you are going to gen con and you want to meet up we will probably be hanging out for a good while at the sun king brewery kickoff party that will be taking place Place Wednesday evening, starting at 5 and going through the rest of the evening where they are going to be releasing this year's Gen Con beer. It's called Everlasting Gamer. It's an American Amber Ale, and it will also be available in 16-ounce cans that they've been doing the last few years. So if it's good, you can take some home with you. That's totally an option. 
Uh, I'm actually really excited. Last year, there was a really cool Led Zeppelin cover band called Les Zeppelin. And this year, they have a band that I kind of grew up knowing about. Local H is the headliner. So if you're a fan of Local H or the other opening band, Brother Oh Brother, both of them will be playing in the Georgia Street Beer Garden on Wednesday as well. So we'll be out there. I will have a Draft Mechanic t-shirt on. I'm so excited. We have Draft Mechanic t-shirts. I completely forgot to mention that yet this episode. You can get one on the website, draftmechanic.net. It's a t-shirt. It's got our logo on it. That's cool. It doesn't have to be a t-shirt, though. It could be a tank top. It could be a v-neck. <laughs> you have many options. They're a little bit difficult to find, but if you scroll down towards the bottom of the page, you can pick your shirt style. Yeah, if you have any questions on that, just shoot us a tweet, and we will answer you, unless we are driving and or asleep. I do want to say, the Sun King beer that they're doing this year, every year it feels like they put out less and less information ahead of time on what the beer is actually going to be, and they hype the naming contest a little bit less every year. Like mm-hmm. This year, in the announcement on the Facebook event for the kickoff party, it didn't even say what the beer was going to be. You had to go into the comments, and somebody's like, hey, um... What is this? It's not anywhere on the event. Mm. So that's a little weird to me that Sun King isn't actually promoting this thing that they brew every year and they sell a bunch (laughs) of it. And you'd think that they'd want to sell more of it and tell people what it is so they can buy it and where to buy it. Because I, from reading through the comments, found out that a couple of the local bottle shops may carry some of it. They didn't seem super sure in their own comment section whether the local bottle shops were going to be carrying Mm. their product, (laughs) which is odd i feel like i would want to get that kind of knocked out before gen con it is the sunday before gen con right now as we are recording this but it is who knows hidden information is really big in board games now so maybe sun king wants to be authentic and get in on that it is kind of interesting to me also that they're doing an american amber ale this year Mm -hmm. which is a weird choice to me for a really hot time of year because an american amber ale is so malty Maybe they want to stay away from pails and IPAs because that is sort of a turnoff for a lot of people who drink beer. Yeah. But I know they did a rye a couple of years ago. I want to say two years ago at this point, mm-hmm. which was like a really out of the expected realm style of beer. And they did pretty well with it. I remember it being very well received. They did. Uh, Last year was a golden ale, I think. So uh, the golden for Gen Con 50, it was the Dragon's Horde or something like Which that. Which made sense with Gen yeah. Con 50. Before that, they had, I think it was a stout or a porter. There was a dark beer, oh, Froth of Khan, that was Froth amazing. Was so good. So now they've gone for an amber, which is neither super exciting nor super hot weathery. Mm. I don't know, something like maybe a Pilsner might have been nice. Or, I mean, if you do it well. Or, a I Kolsch? mean. Sun King, if you're, li- great. if you're I- listening, a Kolsch is the thing for August. I would in have loved a Goza, but I know Ooh. that's not going to happen because that is very mm-hmm. niche for tastes and they want to move it. And you don't generally sell those in 16 ounce cans anyway. <laughs> but anyway, it is an American Amber Ale. It is called Everlasting Gamer, I believe. Yeah, yes. Everlasting Gamer. And they are kicking off the re- release of that on Wednesday at 5. Yeah, and if you are going to Gen Con and you want to communicate with us, obviously you can tweet at us. Also, if you want to hop into our Slack channel, draftmechanic.net slash Slack has all the information on how to sign up for that. Slack's just a, a chat service that we and a lot of other board game media and people in the industry and all that stuff use. And our particular Slack, we have a, a specific channel just for Gen Con that I'm sure we'll be talking with other people that are attending in there and meeting up for a beer every single night because that's kind of how we're going to roll sometimes. Assuming anybody's cell service works. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, moving on to games news, it's going to be really short. Uh, Unsurprisingly, everything we talk about today is going to be news in some way. The one non-Gen Con piece of news that I feel like we should bring up is that we talked about it a few episodes ago, but it looks like it has been confirmed that Eurozeo, the holding company that owns Asmodee, is selling the Asmodee brand and its subsidies to another investment group called Pi Partners, P-A-I Partners. No relation to Pi, though. Hmm. Would, but they were, but no, no <laughs> relation to actual have that Pi money. either, which is sad. You don't know that. Maybe they also have a company that sells Pi at okay. Pi. I mean, they do a lot of a different kind of investments. Um, I don't want to talk about this. Do you have anything you want to say on this other than we, we knew it was coming, I guess? Um, all I can say is I hope that they run it as a business to run it well and to do good things for the industry that it is in and not just as a way to turn around and sell it again Mm -hmm. to make money. If they run it well as a business in the industry, then hopefully that will mean good things. Yeah, I just don't want to see any uh, distribution and or shelf shelf 
elbowing. I'm trying to be positive here positive, positive, for some reason. Positive. Anyway, moving on, I want to talk about Kickstarters because that's the thing we do next. We will talk about a few Kickstarters. Last episode, we talked about three, and I want to just kind of review real quick where we are with them. First up, Hyperbole Games was bringing us SPQF, and it finished today as of recording with 710 backers, about $29,000. This one got up to a third shipment tier. He does a, uh, Grant Rodiek, the creator and maker of this, is doing them in groups since he is directly assembling and building the game himself with those nice laser-cut wooden components, so congrats to that. Second, we have Tiny Dice Buddies from Double Feature. These are the (laughs) adorable little dice enamel pins. This one is ending early on August the 1st. It's uh, currently 111 backers, 3,600 of the $1,400 goal, which is just a few hundred bucks away from unlocking the next stretch goal, which is a set of primary color dice buddies that you can choose as well. These pins are super cute, and I actually went on to the Double Feature Etsy page and purchased some of their other pins because they're also really cool. I got a D&D kind of alignment style set. Uh, the one that I personally picked was Chaotic Good because I've decided that's what I am. Jake and then thinks he's Chaotic Good. They also do a set of kind of like adorable little kawaii style Nintendo console things and I picked up a, was it a, yeah a Nintendo 64 little console so you'll see those on my bag at Gen Con as I walk through the halls and probably I'll be picking up more pins it seems like everybody is doing pins at Gen Con this year I saw people Blue, want pins Blue Orange Games has pins that are just like the logos of their games which is not at all interesting to me I mean you have the restoration ones from last year yeah but those look really cool like the Fireball Island has like the big Volcar thing and the Downforce ones the car like those are doing something not just a pin that has the name of a, a, a thing on it. Gotta get that advertising I march guess. out. Anyway, Tiny Dice Buddies uh, ends on August 1st. Third up is an Indiegogo project that we talked about called 14 Board Games for Africa. This one is ending on August 10th, currently at 5200 of the $12,000 goal, but this is flexible funding, meaning the money will still get to the project if it doesn't reach that goal, which is That's awesome. That's really good. Yeah, I'm really glad that they went for Indiegogo for this thing because this is a really cool cause. They're bringing more board games out of Nigeria and also working to build the first Nigerian board game cafe. So all those things are super awesome. And you can go, we'll put the link in the show notes again for this one to go check that out. If you do have some money to spend and support this one, I think this is a really awesome cause. Once again, this was a really cool sort of funding tier thing as well. It wasn't necessarily you pledge a certain amount of money and you get all 14 games because realistically, that's a going to be huge amounts of shipping and you may not want all the games because Mm -hmm. they are very different and some of them are educational games but they have neat little bundles where you get to pick maybe two small games and a large game and they have all 14 of the games broken down into the different categories that they fit in Mm -hmm. so you can pick what is exactly right for what you want to support and what fits with your collection yeah so go check that out it is called 14 board games from africa and that is on indiegogo new projects new projects all right first one is not a board game because I guess I do that sometimes now in the Kickstarter segments. This one is the 2019 Gaming Calendar done by Scott King. Scott King is a board game photographer, and I think this is probably the fifth, sixth, or seventh, one of those numbers, years, that he has done a calendar of his board game photography. So this one has been well-funded. It's 305%, 9,000 of the $3,000 goal, ending on Saturday, August 18th, being delivered in November. Uh, It hasn't missed a deadline for ones that we've received in the past. These are January to December. December calendar. Yeah, yeah. It's your normal wall <laughs> calendar. It's not no, an 18 month or something. That would not be a good one to have delayed. Uh, so you can back the base calendar for $24, or you can get a custom one where you pick the 12 pictures in it for $36. That also gets you the opportunity to add in some custom holidays. So, for example, we've put our birthdays on in the past and also the day for appreciating the cat. Cat appreciation. Very day. important day. But yeah, this annual calendar of exceptional board game photography has a bunch of new pictures available this year, including Azul, Decrypto, Hardback, Rocky Road All Mode, Food Truck Champion, Rhino Hero, Super Battle, Food Chain Magnate were some of the ones that I saw just kind of quick scrolling through the list there. Uh, yeah, he even makes Food Chain Magnate look good. Like it's a really nice, really oh, nice photo. All the Splatter fans are going to come after you now. <laughs> But yeah, if you want a calendar and you like board game photography, I like this project a lot. Uh, We've had one the last few years, and it's a really just pretty presentation. He does a great professional job with it. So I would encourage you to check out the 2019 gaming calendar. you got a few weeks to look at that one. Next up, we have Escape Plan from Eagle Griffin Games. This is funding at 1,022% of its funding goal, with 510,000 pledged of the $50,000 goal. They've got about 5,000 backers, and this project is running through Friday, August 10th. It is 
scheduled to deliver in June of 2019 if everything goes smoothly. Now, the pledge for this one is going to be $79 for the game, plus tiers to add the Gallerist, Vinos, or Lisboa Kickstarter editions. That's because this is a Vital Lacerda game, and it is going to be one of those big box cool editions that Eagle Griffin does of the Vital Lacerda games like you would have seen for the Gallerist or Vinos or the Lisboa Kickstarter editions. This plays one to five players, and it's a competitive game about fleeing the city after a heist. There's area movement, action spaces, and gathering of money using businesses to sort of funnel your money into either your points, which are going to be useful at the end of the game, or into fluid cash that you're going to be using to move around and to take your actions throughout the game. This is another one of those Vital Lacerda games where you have very few actions, so you're going to want to be very efficient in what you do and make sure that you're not wasting any of your time because you're going to need to escape this city on the third day through the one available exit after all of your money has been gathered so that you can get points when you get out of the city. Mm -hmm. This is, again, a big box, and it's got that great Eno tool art that you've seen in the last couple of Vital Asserta games. This is really cool because it's a very bright palette compared to some of the other games. I know Lisboa certainly <laughs> was and blue. It was very blue, <laughs> and Vinos was sort of pastel in its color palette, but this has, like, nice, bright, saturated colors on it, and it looks like it is not quite as gear grindy brain burning as some of those very heavy games but it's certainly in the medium heavy end of the spectrum mm -hmm. i am really excited to see how this goes they've got 18 stretch goals unlocked on already and there are definitely going to be more to come by the time this project ends oh yeah man the art on this looks so cool and i feel like i'm going to say this every time we see one of these power trio eagle griffin games vital lacerda eno tool games but the design has kind of like that 80s mod style to it i feel is that what I, is that what that is i think you I might don't be know. mixing some stuff there but it is definitely is. <laughs> much more saturated than a lot of the other ones have it, been yeah it's really bright it's really not striking and it looks really good um if you are interested in seeing more about this game, I highly encourage you to check out Paul Grogan's Gaming Rules video. He does the official how to play video for this. It's 40-ish minutes long, as to be expected for one of these bigger, heavier games. But Paul does such an amazing job giving great detail and really clear instruction and really clear video of how the game is going to work. And yeah. yeah. Don't let the 45 minutes scare you off because this is a heavy game, but it's not like a super heavy game. It, like I said, it's in that medium heavy range. Paul is just really, really thorough mm -hmm. about explaining all the different options you have, all the different sub actions in each of the stages of the game. So by the end of it, you're going to feel like you you could pick up that game and reasonably know what you're doing, Yeah, which is great because I have a feeling that there is going to be a lot of nuance that you're going to discover in this <laughs> game and having a really nice overview to start with before you start diving in and picking out that nuance and strategy is going to be a really helpful thing. Mm -hmm. So Escape Plan is on Kickstarter now. you got a little bit of time to back that one. And third up, finally, we have Trogdor, the board game. Yes, this is a board game based on the Homestar Runner intellectual property. is being brought to you by the Brothers Chaps and some other people that they are working with to create Trogdor, the board game. It is... Unsurprisingly, extremely well-funded at 1,123%. That is $840,000 of the $75,000 goal. Nostalgia, nostalgia continues to print money. This one is ending on Wednesday, August 15th, hopefully delivering in June of 2019. Though, with, I'm not kidding you, 14,000 backers, I'm going to guess we're going to get some drift on that release date. For $40, you can get the base game. For $60, you can add on some character meeple or character miniatures. And we are not going to talk at all about the $1,800 backer level for the extremely extravagant edition that comes with a custom Wormwood board and Lazy Susan. And 20 people are actually spending $2,000 on this board game. I mean, I'm a big Homestar Runner fan, but that is just excessive. Anyway, the game is a cooperative game where you are helping Trogdor burninate the countryside. Basically, each player is going to be using their particular player powers and a deck of cards to move Trogdor around the 5x5 five five tile grid, uh, take some actions to flip over those countryside tiles to a burninated side. You are also unsurprisingly going to burninate the peasants and their thatched roof cottages. And I have sort of different opinions on the peasants and their thatched roof cottages as to which edition I like more. <laughs> I really like the little wooden meeple peasant hats that allow them to be in the burninated state where they've got their heads on fire. Mm -hmm. Those are really cool in the little wooden edition, but the thatched roof cottages in the miniatures edition are amazing because you flip the roof over and there is a little burninated section of the, the actual <laughs> thatched roof cottages in 3D and it is just so cute. Mm-hmm. 
if all of this doesn't immediately make sense to you, this is probably something you're going to want to skip. Trogdor yes. is, he has a good following with his one beefy arm. One beefy, beefy arm. Yeah, that miniature for Trogdor, and the Mile High Game guys talked about it on their last episode, seeing Trogdor in three dimensions is quite odd. I don't understand why you wouldn't I assume don't. Trogdor only has that one beefy arm. Like, no. It was pretty clear. What's that arm? Just one arm. Anyway, yeah. Uh, yeah, if you are interested in that, if you don't know what Homestar Runner is, it was a Flash cartoon in the, gosh, 15 years ago, probably, that had a very strong following. I am one of them. You are one of them. Yeah, You're I was going to say, I'm, a I stole Runner hoodie this sweatshirt right from you 15 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, but it is it's a fun fun world and hopefully this game turns out to be good. It looks like it's pretty solid and I know that we're going to have a copy somewhere in our game group unsurprisingly. But yeah, if you are interested in that, it is a thing that exists. There is a Trogdor board game based on the work of of Homestar Runner. So that exists. Congratulations internet. We finally did it. <laughs> we can shut the internet down. There's a Homestar Runner thing happening in 2018. More than just the April Fool's Day one that they post every year. Moving. All right. Well, that is the end of Kickstarters. It is time for us to take a quick breath and give you a little bit of fresh hype. We've actually played some games that we were expecting to put on our Gen Con hype list, and they already exist, and we've already played them, and that means we don't have to speculate. We can tell you about these things. How crazy is this world? So good. All right. Here's the break. Want a second opinion on some of the games we talked about on this episode? Check out some other great content creators at punchboardmedia.com. Coming in hot, it's an expansion for Downforce. How was that segue? Was that <laughs> any good? That's a pretty good car noise. <laughs> All right. So Downforce Danger Circuit is leading off our hype games that we just played. This is an expansion for Downforce, the restoration games racing and betting and bidding and powers and vroom game that came out last year. And this is a expansion, obviously. It came out 2018. This game plays two to six players in 20 to 40 minutes. It is designed originally by Wolfgang Kramer and restored by Rob Davio, J.R. Honeycutt, and Justin Jacobson. The art in this edition... This uh, expansion is by Tavis Coburn, and yeah, Danielle, you want to tell us a little bit about what comes in a this expansion? Mostly, it's just a big board. Woo! A new double-sided board for Downforce. Wow. So if you, if you have played the first two sides that you had, you had your Monaco boat side and your traditional Greenway racetrack side. If you've played those to death because Downforce is an amazing game, wow. this gives you two new tracks. You have the Crosstown Speedway and the Switchback Pass. Switchback Pass is going to add some like dangerous zones that you have to pass through you can't stop in but it allows you to get around people on narrow areas yeah. and the crosstown speedway is going to add essentially express lanes which are going to allow you to beep, go beep. onto a one space wide area if you want to avoid a pile up that is going on with some other players and it also adds sort of loop de loop type jug handle areas where you can block players that are either ahead or behind you by staying in the intersection which i think is really neat these add a little bit of variability and some yeah. fun new mechanics that you didn't have on the original game and it also adds new powers when you play with these expanded boards you can flip up a car like you normally would and you would assign a power to that from the top of the deck well if you're playing with the new boards, you flip up one of the old powers and one of the new powers, and when you buy the car, you get to decide which of those two powers you want to use for the game, which is really exciting because some of the new powers are more useful with the newer boards, whereas some of the older powers may have been better with the old board setup, although some of those old powers are still really, really still good. quite good powers. So it is a, a fun choice that you're being given you're not just playing with the new powers or just playing with the old powers you get a choice of what you want to do the new boards give a little bit of new life you've got some new mechanics this is exactly what downforce needed it didn't need to be completely redone again it was amazing when it came out last year this just gives you another option also the crosstown speedway is so 80s neon like the laser riders color palette is the crosstown speedway <laughs> color palette and switchback pass is really cool. You're going to be zigzagging back and forth, but you do need to go through those danger zones to get around people, which is going to force you to play some high value cards. Otherwise, you're going to get stuck. It's really interesting. And I just really love this. Mm -hmm. It's a bit danger esque, would you say? I wouldn't say How that. How many Homestar Runner references can I fit in the rest of this episode? What do you think? Let's find out. All right. Anyway, Downforce. I've been waiting so long. If you listen to our 
2017 in review game, I, or in review episode. I call this one of my favorite games of the year. It still was one of my favorite games of last year. And this has really kind of become my favorite racing game in general, which is interesting also because it is not just a game about racing. It is a game about betting and predicting and also manipulating the field so that your particular racers or whichever racer you've bet on is the one that's going to get in the finish first and get all the big betting win return monies. Yeah, I'm not really a fan of racing games, and I absolutely love this game. Mm -hmm. And we were talking with one of our friends that we played this with, and he's not a fan of racing games either, but he had a really great moment where at the end of a game, he knew he was going to come back in at the back of the pack, and everybody else was sort of pushing this one player forward because we had all bet on this one player, and he managed to boost up one of the other cars that had been farther towards the back at the beginning of the race so fewer people had bet on but he had bet on it and just Mm -hmm. push that ahead of the one that everybody else was trying to get ahead and it was just that moment of victory for him even though he didn't win his car didn't win he was able to get a whole bunch of points from betting on that car that nobody else bet on Mm -hmm. it was a moral victory that's what i'll call that one I think it might have been an actual victory, too. Maybe second place victory. Also, if something unfortunate happens to happen to your insert, then this all can fit into the base box. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily fit if you keep the insert in its (laughs) original state, let's say. But if you happen to throw it away by accident, then everything fits in the downforce box. Yeah, I had been looking forward to more content for downforce since we first started playing it late last year so to get another map pack like this that also had some cards in there like that's the way to do an expansion just give me more stuff to play with more powers that kind of stuff i'm really hoping that they continue to support this if they put out a new track every year i think i would be happy for another few years here and just judging by the kind of interplay i get on twitter it looks like we might probably get more downforce in the near or not in the near future but in the future which is good it's very good and nobody's mad about that Uh, restoration games if you're listening i can provide you an address and you can send me all the downforce and we can talk about it. I will talk a lot about it. Stop fishing. Okay. Well, I will just wait patiently until I'm able to purchase Downforce Expansion number two. Moving on. Next up, we are talking about Star Realms Frontiers. This is a 2018 release from White Wizard Games. It plays one to four players in 20 to 45 minutes. The designers are Darwin Castle and Rob Doherty, and this is a game of deck building. It's a card game, and it is the third core set with new stuff for Star Realms, including... Command X, OMG. Oh, yes. We will talk about the Command X in a second. But if you did not know what Star Realms is, this is a deck building game. It's a generally one versus one deck building game in which you are purchasing cards out of a trade row in the center to put them into your own personal deck and then using those things to shoot lasers at the other player to diminish their health and eventually win the game. Uh, Frontiers is the new box that they are releasing. This one actually plays one to four players out of the base box, which is nice. They've come up with more formats and more ways to play more than just the the 1v1 duel. And it also has some challenge cards that you can play cooperatively against a common objective, which is really cool. A lot of those actually came out of the Star Realms app, which I think I've talked about in our Gaming on the Go episode or episodes like that. We've definitely talked about the Star uh, Realms app the Star The Star Realms app campaign is fantastic. It's got so much freaking content. And there was a lot of manipulation of decks and a whole ton of fun stuff and you know different rule sets and stuff like that in the app. And Star Realms Frontier and particularly the eight or sorry the seven new foil pack command decks that you can purchase separately from that base frontiers box brings a whole ton of that stuff in and apparently um, i have not played hero realms which is kind of the fantasy spinoff of star realms but apparently hero realms did a similar thing with the character packs where everybody had a starting deck that was something special but in star realms instead of getting your basic eight cards that are the one money and two cards that are the one attack you get a few of each of those cards and then you also get some special special cards that are tailored to your specific commander. Each of the commanders has a special starting circumstance of their hand size and their starting health, and they also come with one or two of these Gambit cards, which are a spinoff from another expansion later earlier on in Star Realms that give you kind of one-time use or constant buffs that change the way that your particular deck will play. And I mean, I guess I just kind of roll into the rest of it here, but the command decks are the star of this particular release of Star Realms. I think Frontiers itself is a good box. It'll get you playing Star Realms, and you'll get a feel for the way the mechanics work, but just picking up these command decks is where the action is at in this. I just, it blows my mind how much it changed the game. 
Now, just to check, you can get Frontiers without the giant size box to put everything <laughs> in, right? Yeah, so the Kickstarter, and we talked about this way back when, this is a Kickstarter that got delayed a little bit, but the Kickstarter also had, in addition to Frontiers and the Command Decks, also stuff like a bunch more promo packs, and there was tons of extra Kickstarter stretch cards that they're going to make available, probably some of them as promo packs later on, but the showpiece of it and where all of my Star Realms currently lives is a very large universal storage box that is only about 40% full, so they have some plans for yeah, this game. Yeah, if you've seen either the big Mystic Veil box or the <laughs> yeah. big Geeky box for Smash Up, it's that size of box. So mm -hmm. that is a thing that's available, but it is not part of the Frontier set, correct? Correct, no. Frontiers is just that small little kind of double-wide deck box, and it comes with enough cards for you to have four different players playing off the same trade deck at the same time. Can we talk about one of the things in Frontiers that I feel like might have been a little tiny bit of a miss? Okay. They redid the way that the health cards were done. Originally in Star Realms, the health cards were were just cards that had denominations on it. So you had a 10 health card and a 5 health card okay. and a bunch of 1 health cards, and you had a pile of them, and that was your health, which was very difficult to A, keep visible for the other players if you're playing anywhere that's got anything moving and B took up a whole bunch of space and you had to make change on your health. It wasn't great. Mm -hmm. So they redid the health to you still use cards, but it is something similar to if you've ever played Matryoshka where you turn the cards a different way to demarcate whether you have 40 points or 30 points or whatever. And then you have a, another card that is giving your ones counter of your life. If you buy Star Realms Frontiers, do yourself a favor. <laughs> Go to your friendly local game store or the internet somewhere and buy yourself a bunch of D10s. It shouldn't cost you more than about five bucks to get, I think you need, eight, what, eight of them to run for four players? Yeah. And just put them next to you and do your health that way because it saves you a whole ton of trouble. Oh, yeah. The cards are nice, I guess, in that it allows you to play straight out of the box, but, like, I would kill for, like, a slider or something. I mean, the D10s work fine. Mm -hmm. I just... I find myself constantly trying to fiddle with them and then realizing I'm not allowed to fiddle with the You D10s. don't do that. That's how you cheat. <laughs> but like a, a slider or something would be nice. And I wouldn't be surprised if somewhere out there, somebody's got some kind of, a, you know, third party solution for that. But regardless, it allows you to play right out of the box. And that's good. But I mean, again, the command decks, I really feel is where it shines. So each of the command decks in these foil packs, they are geared towards two of the four factions. Most of the cards in Star Realms are geared or in a part of a specific faction, and they have ally powers that will uh, power up if you have multiple cards of the same faction out. In the command packs, each of your commanders is basically two of the colors together, and they have cards in their deck that either are one faction or the other, and very occasionally cards that are both. And some of those cards actually go into the trade deck, which is kind of cool, instead of directly into your personal deck but I'm getting too deep on this. Um, but I really enjoy this because it informs your strategy from the very beginning, and it makes the game feel completely different than the super vanilla deck builder. It's kind of like how people talk about Dominion now versus Dominion the base box, though I'm still not super excited by Dominion. You know, I really feel like Star Realms has come into a, a new level with this new content here. They've also added a new double ally power, because normally if you have an ally power on a ship, if you have any ship of the same color, it will activate that ally ability. What they've added is one that you get a better power in addition to your single ally power if you have two other ships of the same power, which really encourages you to go very heavy into one or two colors. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, a lot of the time you need to at least touch into all four of the colors a little bit because if you have no red cards, you're going to have a hard time culling your deck. And if you have no blue cards in your deck, you're never going to be able to regain any of your health. So you have to really walk a thin line between going really hard towards one color to get all of those single ally and double ally powers in addition when you play your cards and getting a deck that is versatile and, and balanced and that lets you do all of the things that you may want to do while still being able to push for a certain strategy. I like it a lot. I do want to say the command decks are 
known to you when you buy them. Like you'll buy the union oh, yeah, faction yeah. or you'll buy, you know, whatever faction you're buying. It's not like you buy a pack and you randomly get one of the factions inside it. So you can go in and buy all the content that you want and know exactly what you're going to get. Mm-hmm. I I enjoyed Star Realms a good bit when it started out, and I definitely just kind of fell out of it in the last year or two. But this new content is going to put it right back in the the forefront of what I want to play. I'm going to have the giant box at all of our game nights moving forward. So when somebody shows up, you know, if Daniel shows up 20, 30 minutes early, we can knock out a game of Frontiers really quick and really just see some of the new synergy. And I'm like, I feel bad in a way because apparently the Star Realms community has stayed really strong since the game's release. I know that there's, you know, constant tournaments and they do organized play. And well, hey, you know what? This is a good time to get back in. This Frontier set is freaking amazing, and especially those command decks, that is where it is at. So huge thumbs up. I'm really excited to be excited about Star Realms again. And that is Star Realms Frontiers. So up third on the recently hyped, recently played list of games, we have Villainous, the 2018 release from Wonder Forge, which is a sub-brand of Ravensburger. This plays two to six players in about 50 minutes, designed by Prospero Hall, with art by, well, Disney. Uh, This is an asymmetric card-playing game where you are villains doing bad things. I mean, who's to say what bad is, I guess it is all just a matter of perspective. But anyway, Villainous. In Villainous, you are going to select to be one of six different Disney villains. You can select to be either Jafar, the Queen of Hearts from Alice in Wonderland, Ursula from The Little Mermaid, Prince John from Robin Hood, you can be Maleficent from Sleeping Beauty, or you can be Captain Hook from Peter Pan. Nailed it. You are going to take the realm that corresponds to your villain, and it is going to have four locations on it. Each of those locations has a group of actions that you can perform if your villain goes to that location. You are going to draw up a hand of cards from your deck, and you're going to place a second deck at the end of your realm, which is your fate deck. That's going to be manipulated by the other players with whom you're playing. On your turn, you're going to move your villain to one of the locations in the realm, and you're going to perform any or all of the actions that are available to you on that location. The location may allow you to play some cards from your hand, which may be allies, which will help you in later fights. They may be items or events that happen right away. It may allow you to discard some cards if you don't like the cards that are currently in your hand. It may allow you to fight a hero if a hero is already in your realm because you don't want any heroes in your realm because you're a villain, obviously. Ooh, heroes. It may allow you to gain some power tokens, which are the currency of the game and are what lets you play cards on your turn. And you are going to be taking whatever the actions are that are on your realm. There's a whole nice player aid that gives you a guide of what all of the action icons are. And they are all fairly clear. I like the action iconography on this game. And you are going to be trying to complete your particular villain's end game condition. Each of the villains have their own goal. And each is briefly summarized on their realm board so everybody else can look over and see what you are trying to do. But each player is also going to get a nice little pamphlet that not only gives you a full in-depth rundown of what your end game condition is, but it explains some of your specific cards if they think they might need a little bit of clarification. You are going to be on your turn, like I said, moving to a location, doing as much as you want of that, and trying to fulfill your end game condition. If at any point you fulfill your end game condition, you are the winner because you are the best villain. And that is the game. Hooray! I did say that some of the other players may be manipulating that fate deck to affect you. And this is really the only way that you are affecting other players. You can never go into another player's realm or play cards specifically from your hand into another player's realm. But one of the actions that may be available at one of the locations in your realm is the fate icon. And that allows you to draw two cards off another player's fate deck and put one of them into play. It may be the hero that I mentioned before, you know, If you are playing against somebody playing Captain Hook, you may draw from that fate deck and it might be Peter Pan or the Lost Boys or Wendy or any one of the characters from that story who is quote unquote good. And you may be able to play that into their realm. Some of them just are sort of detriments to them that aren't necessarily going to stay on the board, but are going to cause them to either lose some resources or have options blocked off from them. When you have a hero in your realm, it's also going to reduce the amount of things that you can do at a specific location because it covers up some of those icons. Again, I really like the way this game is designed. It shows you when you place a hero that those icons are covered and you can no longer do them. You're going to keep going until somebody has completed their endgame condition and they are the winner because they are the best Disney villain. Hooray, or the worst? 
the best. The bestest. These are the best characters in these movies. Come on now. <laughs> so if you don't know a whole ton about Disney, like me, I watched some of the movies growing up, but not really knowledgeable about a whole ton of the stuff here. I was surprised how much I got out of this game. The gameplay is super solid. I really enjoyed the way that all of the car I was playing as Captain Hook and all of the way that all of my cards interacted with each other and the way that I had to particularly manage the hero cards that were coming into play and all the fate cards. And what I was most impressed with is that the three other players that we were playing with, everybody was playing a really different game. Like, we were all obviously playing the game together and interacting through those fake decks, but everybody had their own victory condition and their own way of manipulating cards that everybody had a really cool time and a really cool process. And the thing that blew my mind the most is that we all almost won the game. Yeah, Tamara won, but if she hadn't won, I would have won on my turn, which was next, and you would have won on your turn, which was next. Steven would have won. I think he would have needed two turns mm-hmm. to win. So we were all very, very close. Yeah, I was really surprised to see that for a game that everybody's playing a different set of rules and a different set of interactions, that it balanced out really well. And of course, some of that was probably because we were watching how many curses Steven had out on the board, and we were able to, you know, throw some fate cards his way at the right time, or throw fate cards at you when you were starting to gather a whole bunch of the power coins you were playing as Prince John. And it was also interesting to me how I really needed needed Peter Pan's card to come out of the Fate deck, and y'all knew that, so you stopped playing Fate cards on me in a way, and I actually had to manipulate my own Fate deck to get that card to come out so I could make progress from where I was. For a game that seems on the surface to be a very branded, you know, just another IP kind of project, the gameplay on this uh, villainous is really significant, and I'm really excited to see the way that all of the different characters interact more in the future. Um, I will say, and we can kind of talk a little bit about the negatives here, I don't under well, no, I understand why they allow you to play up to six, but I would never, ever play with six. Four was pretty much the max that I would ever want to play this game at. Yeah, and there was a little bit more drag than I would anticipate in later games because we were learning the game and we were getting to know what you would do. Mm -hmm. But if you are playing a different villain than you played the last game, you still need to learn what you need to do in that particular deck to make sure that you're progressing towards your end game condition at the same rate as everybody else. So there is going to be a little bit of not not learning the game time, but learning your deck time every time you switch villains. Yeah. I agree with you. Four is really the highest I would go here. I have a feeling that five and six were put in there because you can sell more games if you say it goes up to six players. But I would say this is a two to four player game. Yeah, and I would really, like, I would want to play this at three. I kind of almost expect the two players would be pretty rough, just because you really only have that one other player to interact with, so it could get unbalanced. I don't know, maybe it can't. I mean, they could have done just a really good job balancing this game out at all player counts. I really liked it at four, because at four there was enough time if two people needed to be fated at i don't know how to make that a verb any better but like if two people were coming a little too close to winning for everybody's comfort then you could sort of divide and conquer maybe one person goes and puts a fate deck on one of the players and one uses the fate deck on the other player or in the situation like we had one round where somebody has already used the space because you have to move every turn steven in one of our rounds We needed to do the fate deck as many times as possible, but he was already standing on the space he had with with the fate deck. So with four players, there's enough variability in where people are standing and Mm -hmm. what actions are available that you can really get a nice versatile spread of actions. Yeah, I'd really like to come back to this one in the future after we've had a chance to play more interactions between all of the different villains and see what kind of stuff it comes at. This might be a good six-pack review for us in the future just because of how much interaction the different roles are going to have in this. I will say, since you are playing a completely different condition than everybody else, and because the end conditions are only summarized on their board, it is really important that you ask people at the beginning of the game and routinely throughout the game what their win condition is Mm -hmm. and, you know, you know what questions to ask as to what they've progressed towards. Especially since a lot of the cards have text on the bottom, which is fairly small and if you're sitting at a big table like we are i couldn't see all of the writing on the card across from me right so a lot of the times i knew that 
Maleficent's win condition is to have curses at all four locations. And every time it came back to my turn, I would say, hey, how many curses do you have? Where do you have curses now? Because I, I just couldn't see it. Mm-hmm. And that is just the nature of having completely different things going on and having a lot of information on the cards. But it is important that after you read your little booklet, I think that everybody knows what the steps for the win condition is for each of the players. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that this game is also super ripe for expansion. We, oh, yeah. Even like halfway through the game that we were playing today, we were already kind of spinning off and thinking, okay, well, they could easily just do another box with another six villains in it. So I would not be surprised if the Disney merch machine gets that rolling sometime in the near future. Oh, and they knew exactly who they were marketing this to. Mm-hmm. These aren't the newer Disney movies that are in this game. These are Disney movies that were popular in the 80s and 90s when the people that they're aiming at this game to to pay out the $35 at Target mm-hmm. were younger or a lot of them were watching Disney movies or honestly just between the two main brackets of gamers that I know had kids that were watching mm-hmm. Disney movies. So they know who they're marketing at. I have a feeling if we get a couple of years down the road, there'll be a pack that has you know some of your classics, but also some of the Disney movies that were a little bit newer from this group so they'll just keep moving forward with that you know what that does mean though eventually they're going to put darth vader in one of these things because that is a disney villain now i'm sorry i've ruined it yet again i mean these are all animated movies so i don't think clone wars was animated oh why do i know that i'm sorry i'm a star trek guy don't don't hold it against me anyway villainous yeah surprisingly good so if you are looking for that and that sounds interesting you can go check that out uh, apparently pretty soon this or game now. lets me be the disney villain i wanted to be when i was eight <laughs> years old and i love it for that <laughs> heck yeah well we enjoyed it so much that we decided to put this one on tap so i think it is time for us to go to the bump music and come back with the beer pairings for villainous For more information on the beers we chose to pair with today's game on tap, check out the show notes section at our website, draftmechanic.net. So in case your short-term memory is failing you, we are about to put Villainous on tap. Villainous is the 2018 release from Wonder Forge and, well, subsidy of Ravensburger. Two to six players, 50 minutes, designed by Prospero Hall with art by Disney, because this is a board game of Disney villains. Danielle, would you like to lead us off with the first Villainous beer pairing? It is very literally the Villainous beer pairing, because from Around the Bend Beer Company in Chicago, Illinois, we have Villainous. American IPA, it comes in at 6.3% ABV and 70 IBU. This is an IPA brewed with four different strains of yeast. Two of them are British strains, and two of them are U.S. West Coast strains. This creates a really cool complex flavor, and it is available on draft and in cans. Also, people who drink this beer are very bad at making sure that they are logging the right beer on Untapped. I know this for reasons that will really quick, really, really quickly become apparent. All right. So second from Magic Rock Brewing in Huddersfield, West Yorkshire, England, we have Villainous, an American IPA, 6.5% ABV, made with 100% Vienna Malt, Cascade, Citra, Clustered, Equinox, and Magnum Hops. Very tropically fruity with flavors of mango, papaya, guava, grapefruit, and citrus. This beer has a rotating availability on draft, not in cans. Even though half the people that post photos of this on Untapped are actually checking in that Around the Bend Beer Company beer, (laughs) which is available in cans. Pay attention, people. There's different artwork. (laughs) It's very important because then we can find the right beers on Untapped as well. Well, I mean, it also affects that there are ratings and the comments. Like if you're scrolling through and it's like, oh... This isn't, or this is super citrusy, or this has lots of different yeasts. Like, you want to have the comments be right. Okay, very true. Number three, Danielle? Next up from Lucky Bucket Brewing Company in La Vista, Nebraska, we have Certified Evil. This is a 9.1% 48 IBU Imperial Oatmeal Stout. Now, I could have sworn Mm. this used to be a Belgian Mm -hmm. strong dark ale. And some of the internet actually backs me up on this. But if you look at Lucky Bucket's website, it is absolutely non-existent. It's just a (laughs) splash page that says, like, drink our beer, it's good. And it doesn't tell you anything about the beer. But it has been an Imperial Oatmeal Stout for at least the last two years, if you go back to their Instagram. And their Instagram goes back farther than that, but it doesn't have any pictures of the old Certified Evil, Hmm. which there are some pictures of on untapped check-ins. So I'm guessing they changed the formula on this. Either way, it is currently an Imperial Oatmeal Stout, and it is very well regarded. It's real malty, but they put some hop in there to sort of balance it out. It is a good beer. It is available in 12-ounce bottles. It is available year-round for them. Go check it out if you get Lucky Bucket Distribution, which is, I think, a lot of the Nebraska area and sort of the Midwest. Mm -hmm. 
I think you're right, because I remember bringing some of that back from Tennessee at one point, and it was definitely not an oatmeal stout. No, it was definitely, it definitely used to be a different formulation. Mysteries of the internet. Yeah, and if you go to Beer Advocate, which is the non-untapped place I get a lot of the beer information to double check stuff, there is definitely Certified Evil Belgian Dark Ale, and then there is Certified Evil 2, which is the Imperial oh. Stout. But it looks like they might have reformulated the Belgian Dark Ale at some point as well. So this went through a little bit of a change. But if you have had it at least since 2016, that's the beer we're talking about. This is an oatmeal stout, and it is very good. Hmm, that's some sneaky circumstances, but here at Draft Mechanic, we dig deep to find you the best information on whatever the heck that beer actually is. Moving on, 18th Street Brewery in Hammond, Indiana has a Villain. It's an Imperial IPA, 8.4% ABV, 66 IBU, brewed with Warrior, Falconer's Flight, and Simcoe hops. It's citrusy, but it also has pininess to it, so if that's not your thing, steer clear. This has a rotating availability in 16-ounce cans, and obviously on draft if you're ever into that region. I really like their taproom. I've been there a few times, and it is quite good. And finally, from Two Towns Cider House in Corvallis, Oregon, we have the Bad Apple, because villains, after all, are bad apples. Yeah. And, you know, there is a certain Disney villain who's not included in this game, but we're not going to rule them out as an expansion content, who is very into bad apples, if you know you're Snow White. I don't I don't know. Which one is that? It's the Wicked Queen and Snow White. Snow White. Yeah, she, oh, with the poison apple. The apple. Yeah, okay. okay. These Got are it. probably not poison, by the way. No. This is a cider which has 10.5% ABV, and it is an imperial-style cider brewed with local metal foam honey, and is aged in Oregon white oak barrels. Yo! It comes in 500 milliliter bottles, and actually, when I found this, I was looking through and I saw the name of the Cider House, and I was like, that sounds really familiar, and I pulled up our Slack channel, and listener... Megan Naxer had recently been traveling up in the Pacific Northwest, and she had told us about the cidery, and I went actually into the threaded comments, and she had really recommended this particular cider, and it just sort of stuck in my brain as the name of the cidery, so we have backup on this one to say that this is an absolutely amazing cider if you have the option to give it a try, because Megan has very good taste in her beers and ciders as well. I very much will vouch or take her vouch for this being excellent. So if you have that opportunity, try the bad apple with your villainous. Cool. So those are some beer pairings and cider pairings for villainous. If you're looking for more information on those breweries and beers and cideries and ciders, we will obviously have them up on the website, draftmechanic.net. Click on the show notes tab up at the top, go to episode 80, the one called uh, the Gen Con hype list. And that's where the information will be on the internet. Meow, let's get on to that hype list. Did you say meow? As a Viking leader, I know a thing or two about what it looks like to fight off a whole horde of incoming attackers. <laughs> Gunner! I also know about properly assembling and arming a fighting force that sometimes some folks are just going to die in battle. Okay, that's it. No more from you. We are talking about Run Fighter Die Reloaded, the newest Kickstarter from Grey Fox Games. They are not only bringing their beloved zombie survival game back into print, but they've updated it to reduce fiddliness and added new character combos, survivor health, and more minis and action dice. Any Viking worth their salt could take on that whole zombie horde with their beard tied behind their back. This new standalone game in the Run Fight or Die universe is everything you loved about the original but better. Check it out on Kickstarter until August 21st. Gray Fox Games, quality games cleverly crafted. So, the first thing I want to say is if you are going to Gen Con or you have anybody that you know that's going to Gen Con that might pick stuff up for you, go to Board Game Geek and look through their Gen Con preview. It is a super functional and really useful tool for anybody who wants to know what's coming out. Even if you're not going and you just want to know what is the new, really exciting stuff that is either being demoed or has been announced or is being released for sale, it is a great tool. It lets you know whether something is available for demo or if it's going to be for sale. A lot of times if it's for sale, it will let you know what the price is going to be. It has broken down by publisher. You can rate things so that when you filter them, they only come up with stuff that's really interesting to you once you've rated them. It is an absolutely phenomenal tool. I know we went on a big tirade about how great it is last year, but I do just want to say they continue to make this a more useful and more functional tool. And I am just very excited about, about how great a thing this can be. If you in any way want to look at what's coming out, that is the place to go. 
And I would like to say that there are 613 titles on the Geek Preview as of time of recording. I predicted 650, you predicted 500. That means that I am the winner. I was closer to being correct. Now I'm playing by Price's Right rules. <sighs> you just have to bring in your own scoring system to win this one. I, I... didn't invent this. Bob Barker <laughs> invented this. So yeah, 613 titles for you to pour through. Some of that is obviously demos that you cannot purchase. Some of it is stuff that you can purchase. And there is also a chunk of that that is expansion content. So we figured maybe we'll start out just by talking about expansions. So Danielle, you want to lead us off with something that's on your hype list? Yeah, we figured that if you didn't have these games, then you probably wouldn't want the expansions. But these are expansions that we are really, really jazzed about. My like number one thing that I am so excited about is the executives and more executives expansions mm-hmm. for the networks. This was a game that we've gotten a bunch of play with in our game group. And we got to actually try out the executives expansion when it was in its prototype phase. But I'm so excited to get that in final copy and also to get that more executives mini expansion that they were going to have there. It is great additional content for an already fun game, and I am just really jazzed for it. Agreed. I'm super excited about this. Networks is one of these games that continually pops up for us. We are always bringing it to game nights, and getting to play those executives last fall just got us so excited about this particular expansion. And I'm really excited to see what final tweaks Gil put on it as this stuff was getting finished out in the Kickstarter. So yeah, the executives and more executives, and uh, there's another tiny thing called Telly Time that may or may not be available, but I'm excited to see if that little expansion is also available. Um, I'm going to kind of cheat and say a expansion that we already have a copy of, but we have not yet talked about. This is the Scythe, the Rise of Fenris expansion. This is one of the highest thumbed up items on the Geek Preview. Unsurprisingly, Scythe is a super hot title, and the Rise of Fenris is a campaign expansion for Scythe. It is non-destructible, non-modifiable, so you can continue to replay and use any of the modules afterwards. But we got this in the mail a few days ago, uh, and just like I I took off the lid and I did not open any of the stuff because the punch board on the side of it, the one part of the punch board you can see just says, warning, every single one of these punch boards has spoilers if you are concerned about it for the campaign. I just, I'm so excited to dig into that. We've been really enjoying Charterstone, so I'm excited to see what kind of surprises Jamie Stegmeier and the co-developer Ryan Lopez de Venaspre bring to the Scythe world. So uh, I'm sure that this is going to be the first stop for a lot of people, and thankfully we already have a copy of it, so I do not have to run into that giant line. The next thing I wanted to point out is that the Matainai expansion that had that very short Kickstarter a couple of months ago, I think they only did like a 10 or 12 day Kickstarter, is going to be for sale at Gen Con. So if you did not get a chance to back that Kickstarter because it was very short, this is one of those things that you'll be able to pick up if you are a fan of Matainai. I can't imagine that you weren't on that Kickstarter, but for, for some reason you did not get in on that. That is going to be something that you can pick up. I am excited to see that. Mm -hmm. Another one that I have on my radar is actually two expansions. These, These are expansions for a game that I have been wanting to play, but have not had the time to get to play as much as I want to. And this is two new expansions for Star Trek Ascendancy from Gale ah. Force 9. We have the Andorian Empire and the Vulcan High Command. Both of these, I guess, specifically from the Enterprise era of Star Trek TV shows. So I'm interested to see in power how they kind of balance those versus the next generation world that everything has been so far. Obviously, the Andorians and the Vulcans still exist, but just from my knowledge Obviously. of Star Trek, I know that this is specifically the Enterprise era stuff, so I'm excited to add more in here. We still haven't had a chance to play with the Cardassians or the Ferengi or the Borg expansion, which I do kind of feel bad about, but we've talked with our game group and we uh, definitely have some interest in getting those to the table soon. So hopefully we get to do that before these new expansions come out and we get just even more ascendancy. I am very, very excited to have more of that. Enterprise is your Scott Bakula's? Yes, a Scott Bakula one in the in the way past. The earliest of all Star Treks that for some reason is the most recent, I guess, other than Discovery. My next thing that I'm excited about is the five and six player expansion for Sagrada. Mostly because every time we pull Sagrada off the shelf, so many people are really excited to play it. It's such a great game and it has so much appeal when you put it out on the table. So many people want to play it. But a lot of times, because it's only a four player game, you either end up saying, oh, I'm sorry, you know, we're full up already. Or I'll actually take the game and put it back on the shelf and grab something that plays everybody that wants to play. Well, now Sagrada is going to play up to six and they are modifying the way that the game plays so that you don't have that really extended downtime that would come from a serpentine draft where you're the first player of six and you have to wait for essentially 13 more or not 13 11 more drafts Mm -hmm. till it gets back to you 
But I'm really excited because I think this is going to make Sagrada a game that comes out even more than it already does for us, which is just aces in my book. Yeah, I'm really interested to see how these private dice pool work. I don't really know a whole lot about it other than the fact that they are adding some new mechanics in there that will be decreasing the amount of downtime that you have in a higher player count game. So I'm excited to see it. And I know that they're bringing in some more pattern cards and also uh, more, obviously more dice, but some more tool cards as well to make this even more exciting and some more stuff in there. Another expansion I've got on my radar is the Clank in Space Apocalypse. And yes, all of those do have their own exclamation mark. This is an expansion, obviously, for Clank in Space that is going to be adding more ad game board modules, more adventure deck cards, more large cards, uh, and another big boss marker. I'm excited to see them continuing to support Clank in Space with its own expansion content in addition to Clank, which has had two expansion modules so far. I kind of, when this was released last year at Gen Con, everybody's kind of like, oh, Okay, so are you stopping base Clank? And then there was obviously uh, the Mummy's Curse that was released for that. And people were like, oh, okay, so was Clank in Space a one-off? But no, it looks like they are going to do two completely different paths of Clank here that are each going to have their own expansion content. Uh, we have a copy of Clank in Space that we picked up at the Geekway Play to Win or the, the trade table back at Geekway to the West. So I'm excited to see more expansion content come out for that. And just, you know, more Clank, more f options, more kind of fun there is always welcome. So I'm hoping that this one is as good as the expansions for base Clank were as well. Uh, yeah, that is Clank in Space Apocalypse. The final expansion that we haven't already talked about, because we obviously already talked about Downforce Danger Circuit, so I don't think we need to talk about it again here. But the final expansion that I'm excited about is the Imhotep A New Dynasty expansion. This is only going to be demoed, so it's not going to be available for purchase. But I'm excited to see what they're going to add to Imhotep, which is already a really streamlined game, but one that has a whole lot of chaos in it to try and change that and add to it. They are adding new god cards that allow you to predict the way that buildings are going to be completed and are going to give you benefits if you predict them correctly. They are adding new chariots. They're also adding in new buildings so that there is going to be a little bit of variability. So I'm excited to see how this adds to Immortep and whether or not that's something that I would like to add into that game when I play it because I really do love the just absolutely created chaos that Imhotep already is, where you can plan as best you want to put everything on a boat and somebody else can just go in and send that boat to a completely different place and just absolutely screw up what you were planning to do. So I think I'm interested to see what adding more to this game does to it. Hmm. And I'm glad to see it as a demo without actually, you know, before we would have a chance to purchase it, because that way... I know what I'm getting into if I decide to go into that when it comes to market. Okay. I have two other expansions to bring out. Mm -hmm. uh, first up, King Domino Age of Giants. This is an expansion for both King Domino and Queen Domino. It Ooh. does work with both, but it's going to add another way to manipulate, obviously, the, the tiles and the scoring in King Domino. This one in particular adds in the giants that will be brought out whenever a specific t a domino comes out. If you select a domino that has, what is it, a giant symbol or something like that on it, you have to place a giant into your kingdom, and it will cover up one of your scoring crowns. Oh, no. Obviously bad because the covered scoring crown will not score. There are, of course, ways to remove the giants as well and give it to an opponent, and then you're going to continually cycle these around the kingdom. So it's a little more interactivity between everybody as you're pushing these things around, which some people are going to like, some people aren't going to like. The one thing that I do also like in here is that they're adding in some end of game objectives. For example, the one that they talk about here is you get five bonus points for each lake tile that surrounds your castle or get 20 bonus points if your castle is located in one of the four corners of your kingdom. In base King Domino, there's some optional end game variants that if you have a perfect five by five grid or if your castle is directly in the center, you get bonus points. So this gives you more opportunities to have known scoring objectives for the end of the game. So I'm very excited about that. And another thing, just unnecessary, awesome little touch, the box art on King Domino Age of Giants fits onto the left side of the King Domino box, which is great because the Queen Domino box fits on to the right side of the King Domino box. So you have a nice three box panorama out of all this stuff. I think we're being unfair to the giants here. Why do they have to be all negative? Well, they're just big. They step on your crowns. Oh no. Because they're up there. They're up there and they're moving on and stepping on crowns. All right. Finally, um, I'm just going to say the thing that everybody else is going to say. Terraforming Mars has another expansion coming out at Gen Con. This one is Prelude. Danielle is very down on it already. I, yeah, they can't see me making that face. I don't like the idea of starting with more in your 
sort of little player board area. I like the fact that you create everything from zero. When we play, we play with no production other than what your initial faction would give you. And I like the idea that you build it up immediately from scratch. I say that, and when I know you're going to get it, uh, when we play with it, I will probably enjoy it. It's just not something I really needed in my terraforming Mars. <laughs> but I don't even know what I need more in my terraforming Mars, and I think there's like three more expansions coming. So Oh, the train is going to keep on a rolling. But anyway, this one... Train. The Mars train. This one does have those new uh, five new corporations, and it also has the cards that will give you kind of a variable starting setup. I do like that. I'm interested to see how that works. I like variable starting setups. It makes everybody's strategy a little bit different. So getting a chance to diversify a little bit right at the beginning of the game will be interesting. I'm excited to see how it works. Obviously, like you just said, I'm probably going to pick this up as soon as I possibly can because I like terraforming Mars and more modules is fun for now. Don't carcassone this thing too hard. I don't need 59 <laughs> expansions. And I swear to God, if they put a catapult on Mars, we're going to have words. All right. Uh, that pretty much wraps it up for expansions for me. Do you want to move on to main big game stuff? Let's get to the standalones. Okay. So first up, I wanted to talk about games that I guess generally aren't stuff that I'm hyped to go immediately look at because it's stuff that I've either already kickstarted or games we already own that are getting new additions. The first most notable thing is there is a new version of Arboretum, the card game, coming from Renegade Game Studios. We have the old Z-Man version. We've enjoyed it quite a bit. Mm -hmm. But the new art is absolutely gorgeous. Mm. I wouldn't say that it is necessarily better than the original version. They're both very good. They're just a little bit different. Mm -hmm. But I do enjoy the new art quite a bit. If you don't have this game, it's a phenomenal game. It's a lot of hard decisions that really just makes you think in a really simple mechanic. Like you don't do a lot of stuff in Arboretum, but you think about a lot of things while you're doing not a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Also a number of games that we have kickstarted, but have not yet delivered, but should be delivering in the next week or two. Uh, first off, the big score coming from Van Ryder Games. We played this in a demo at Gen Con last year. It kickstarted shortly thereafter. Really enjoyed it. I'm super excited to get this in there. It's got a fun kind of card management thing where you're assigning your different kinds of workers or specialists to thieves. different jobs. <laughs> thieves. I'm trying to be diplomatic here. They're specialists. They have all special abilities. But you're basically, you're assigning them to different jobs secretly with the hopes of contributing some to completing this job, but not so much that you can't be in a whole bunch of jobs all at the same time. But if whatever that particular job's requirements aren't fulfilled, nobody gets any payout, and that's a big bad bummer. And then it all culminates in a Kind of almost a second game, which is this kind of push your luck as you're pulling different tokens out of this big bank vault, depending on how well you did in the first half of the game. This is a lot of fun. There's also an expansion coming out at Gen Con, so you can pick up both of those. They are both going to be for sale, so if you that is interesting to you, might want to check that out. Yeah, I'm excited to see this one deliver. We also have Welcome 2, which is from Deepwater Games, that mm -hmm. should be delivering sometime soon. I know they've had a couple of problems with the fulfillment on this one that are just various and, and sundry problems, but it should be coming sometime soon, and I know they will probably be demoing the heck out of this game because they are very excited about it, and it's been receiving a whole bunch of good mm -hmm. review, reviews and press and all that type of thing. This is a flip and fill, which is essentially a card version of a roll and write, where you are <laughs> Are filling in this different neighborhood so welcome to whatever the name of the town is and it is just it looks really cool i like the artwork on it i like uh, i mean a roll and write is always good in this house and a flip and fill i assume to be equally good right i mean it's <laughs> essentially the same thing just without dice yes Another game I have on my Kickstarter radar that you'll be able to demo at Gen Con actually comes from our sponsor. It is a game called City of Gears. This is from Gray Fox Games. This is a game that I had an opportunity to play right before it was kickstarted, and I just really, really enjoy this game. Uh, it's kind of a modular board setup where you are putting your little workers out into that modular board setup and creating chains of workers that allow you to activate the tiles depending on how you have your workers connected. There's also a good bit of take that in it in just that you're kind of getting in the way of other people's workers or burning out their robots. But I'm really excited to see this game. It was a lot of fun to play. I'm excited to see the, some more final version of it. The components are just looking fantastic. All of the different tiles are going to be connected by these little plastic gears that also then manipulate the ways in which the tiles are going to be working. There's all sorts of different variability setup things in this, and it was a lot of fun. And I'm excited that they're going to have a copy for demo there. I heard that they were trying to get it done for Origins, but couldn't quite get it done to demo at Origins. But you'll be able to see it, hopefully, at Gen Con at the Gray Fox Games 
move. Uh, one of the other things that we have kickstarted, and if you are listening to this and you have acted on our kickstarters this episode, you may have kickstarted <laughs> as well, is I'm excited to see Escape Plan in person. They are just obviously demoing this since the Kickstarter is just going to be ending in the very beginning of August. But I am really excited to just see a physical copy of this and die, take that knowledge that I got from that Paul Grogan Rules video and really look at the demo that they're going to have there. I'm excited to just make sure that it is everything that I think it's going to be, but I think it's more just going to be me hyping myself up even more for this thing when it does deliver. I've also kickstarted, and I'm very excited to see the first three games in the Tokyo Games series by the newly rebranded Jordan Draper Games. This is a series of games, uh, Tokyo Jiro Hanbaiki, Tokyo Jukatu, and Tokyo Metro. These are three different games. The first one is a very quick game of basically Japanese vending machines and drinks with a whole bunch of different little mini games. Uh, Tokyo Jukatu is the architecture game where you're kind of assembling your pieces in specific ways to match patterns. And then Tokyo Metro is more of a heavier economic and train kind of game. But they're the first ones in this system of games that Jordan Draper is designing. And there's going to be two more of the next ones uh, visible or for demo at Gen Con as well, but his plan is to have all of this series of games that are then combinable in certain ways to kind of use the pieces in between to create even more games as the set eventually grows. So I think he wanted to do nine or 12 games, something like that. I know one of the ones that is being previewed, I, it, I don't know if it's part of this particular set because it seems like more of a side game, but it's called uh, Tokyo Washi Cats. It is Tokyo Washi Game Cats. Yeah. And yeah, this is the one I wanted to talk about because obviously <laughs> this actually is played with washi tape and you are taking your cat through the city to try and find fish. So I'm excited to see how this plays because I just, I mean, <laughs> I just like cats and, and washi tape. <laughs> and washi tape. So I'm excited to see what this is. I mean, it looks like Jordan Draper Games has a whole bunch of really neat ideas for how to put these different styles of games out on the table. And I want to see what this is it had mentioned in the preview that this is the first of the games that use washi tape so maybe this is something that he's going to create in a different series i'm excited to see what it is and help those cats find that fish okay so that is tokyo jiro hanbaiki tokyo metro and tokyo jukatu and tokyo washi game cats (laughs) All right, a few others in the Kickstarter games-ish segment that are available for demo. First up from Burnt Island Games, Endeavor Age of Sail, which is kind of a big box game where you are striving to earn glory for your empire. You're sailing out from Europe and uh, the Mediterranean, establishing shipping routes and occupying cities the world over. This is a remake of, obviously, Endeavor with new art and uh, new visuals and graphic design by the original artist, who is Josh Capel, also of, obviously, Burnt Island Games. I'm really excited to see this uh, get re-released. I never had a chance to play the original, and the new one just looks absolutely stunning. Additionally, you can go check out Legends of Sleepy Hollow from Greater Than Games and Dice Hate Me Games. This has been a passion project of that team for a while. It's a campaign game with cool minis, and it's got this really awesome kind of hinged box. It's actually the first in their dragon size box, I think is what it is called. Mm. Uh, Dice Hate Me Games has always named the specific sizes of their boxes for standardization, and this is the first one in the biggest size that they have always planned out, but not yet released until Legends of Sleepy Hollow. That's coming this fall. Um, I'm super excited to see it, and Chris Kirkman of Dice Hate Me Games has been gushing about the miniatures that they finally got the first copies of in, and they're going to be visible, and you can go check them out at the Greater Than Games booth. Also from Greater Than Games and Dice Hate Me Games, I'm excited to demo Homebrewers. I actually have a ticketed demo for this, so I'm going to be able to sit down and play a full game of it. And this is where you are trying to create the best homebrews for a homebrew competition. It's sort of in line with Brewcrafters, that sort of style where they've been doing beer games already. They have Brewcrafters and Brewcrafters, the card game. But in homebrewers, you are actually trying to create the best homebrew recipe to win this homebrew competition. We've actually been hearing about this for a while. Chris Kirkman is also a Punchboard Media member. So he's been talking to us about this because he he obviously knew it was in our wheelhouse. What with this (laughs) 
craft beer and board games podcast we happen to do. But I'm really excited to be able to sit down and play a full game of it at a ticketed a demo. So that's one of the things I'm very jazzed about. Okay, so that kind of rolls in pretty smoothly to the section of games that are games we have not yet kickstarted and do not already own. So like the actual hype part the of the hype we're actually hyped about. Okay. Okay, so I've got the geek preview pulled up in front of me here and I have filtered out um, th- filtered out things that are pre-ordered or owned and are standalone games and also I've either tagged must have or interested. And you have a spreadsheet that kind of is a similar effect over there? Of course I have a spreadsheet. Daniel has a spreadsheet. It's so color coded. I have 90 titles of which I will not speak about all 90 because I do not want to make this a six and a half hour episode. I don't want to speak about all 90. <laughs> so I wanted to start out with Bosk from Floodgate Games. This is two to four players, 20 to 40 minutes. It'll be available for demo as a game of area control and area influence with some grid movement and abstract strategy. I'm really excited about this game, too. This is a game about putting trees into a forest, and we have been burned by some tree forest game before. <laughs> so I'm hoping that Bosk is the game that I wanted some photosynthesis to be, where you are going to create these trees and making the trees is interesting. I think it's also kind of cool that this game has sort of two phases where you place the trees and that's its own game. But after that, the trees drop their leaves and you get points based on where the leaves go as well. The other one coming from Floodgate Games that I'm really interested to see is Bad Maps. This one is three to five players, 30 to 60 minutes. It'll be available for demo, obviously. Uh, Action and movement programming and also some betting and wagering with a pirate theme. Yar. All right. So in Bad Maps, basically, you're going to be hiding treasure all over the board, and then you're going to be programming your minions by using these, uh, you know, treasure map cards. And depending on the round, some of them will be face up, some of them will be face down. So your minions are probably going to get lost along the way, which is always the fun of a programming game when the programming kind of derails. And hopefully you will get your minions somewhat close to the treasure so that you can score the points. So I I don't really see a whole lot about how the betting in here works or betting in wages. Maybe it's just that I'm, you know, expecting that I'm going to be able to get my minions closest to whatever treasure, but this seems like it's going to be a really fun, interesting design, and I'm really excited to see where Floodgate Games is going with these two. Obviously, they had a huge hit with Sagrada last year, and we've had a few fun games from them in the past, so I'm really excited to see them hopefully starting to gain some steam and start becoming one of these small little publisher houses that we love seeing all the games come out of. Yar. Yar it is. Speaking of games that are coming out of Floodgate, I want to talk about a game that's not actually coming out of Floodgate. It's coming out of Artana, but it is coming from the designers of Sagrada. Hmm. So Adrian Adamescu and Daryl Andrews. This is called Speakeasy Blues, and this kickstarted a while back, but we did not actually get in on it. But this is a game where you are also going to be doing the dice worker placement style game, but it is themed after the Roaring Twenties, obviously, from the title mm-hmm. Speakeasy Blues. I really like the art on it, and I like the idea of an- another dice worker placement game from these two because I very much like what they did with it the first time. So I'm curious to see how this is. I want to see it. I want to get a little bit more information, see maybe if this is something that I should have gotten in on on the Kickstarter. And it looks like I believe that they are going to be, yeah, it is going to be for sale. So if that's something that I feel like I have mistakenly not backed, I'll be able to pick up. Yeah, definitely on my radar as well. Although looking at my fancy color-coded spreadsheet, it looks like the MSRP is about 60 bucks. So that may have been why we didn't get in on the Kickstarter, <laughs> if that's the, the price that they were kickstarting it at. So I do want to see this before we go in and get it. One small little game that I am super excited to see is the fourth Fast Forward game. This is coming from Stronghold Games. This is obviously designed by Friedman Fries. We talked about three of them last year, Fortress, Flea, and what was the last one? Fear. Mm-hmm. And this one is called Fortune. This, uh, I don't know a whole lot about it other than the fact that it looks like it is a slot machine-based kind of game. That is what the art uh, yeah. would indicate, yes. The reels are spinning, tension is rising. Is this a new high score? It's not about the money, but rather try to score more points than all the other players. So I really enjoy Enjoyed the way the fast forward games worked. And while there were some ups and downs on some of them, you know, specifically with the way that you learn the game and some rules that weren't 100% clear, I love the system. I love the idea. And I'm really excited to see Friedman Freeze continue on with this series. I was kind of worried that after that reception of the first three that he might not come back at it. But it looks like we have a fourth one that will be coming and it is called Fortune. So you can hopefully see that for demo at the Stronghold Games booth. Yeah, and a lot of those base rules in the those fast forward games are right at the beginning. So if you're getting a demo, you'll be able to see if the rules seem pretty clear to you when you're doing the demo. So I I look forward to seeing if it is a good one that we need to pick up. Mm -hmm. 
my like gold star at the top of my list thing that I most want to see at Gen Con is a game called Warsaw City of Ruins. And this is actually used to be called Capital. And it came out from Grana Games, I believe a year ago or maybe the year before at Essen. But North Star Games is actually bringing it over. And I'm mm. really excited to see this. This is a game that has the theme of the fact that the city of Warsaw was so destroyed after World War II that there is a lot of mixed architecture in the different areas of the city. You, you know, the city was started back in the 1600s and there's some much older buildings and then there is some immediately pre-war buildings and then there's a lot of post-war and sort of Soviet style buildings. And it takes that idea and it makes you develop a very restricted area, but it is still a city development game. And I'm very, very excited. I wanted it when it was capital, but it was one of those things that wasn't really available in the US very much. So I'm very excited to see Warsaw City of Ruins from North Star. Yeah. And it's not really what they normally bring over it. Like if I had said, oh, who do you think is putting this game out? I don't think North Star would have been the person I would have initially thought. Mm -hmm. So that's exciting to me to see that they are going in that particular direction. I don't know if they have a partnership with Grana that's going to continue and they're going to get a whole bunch of stuff, maybe the CV civilization stuff. Mm -hmm. That is speculation. I am, I'm not saying that that's a thing that's happening, but I'm curious to see where it goes with that because this is sort of very different from their party games and their lighter games that they've been coming out with. You know, your monster matches which is absolutely amazing or they have two games dude and dude. more dude coming out which are very <laughs> light party fun games so i'm i'm excited for this and i'm definitely gonna go make sure that they take my, my money yeah well i know that north star games is very excited about bringing happiness to people so they found a new way to get happiness directly to you with, with polish Warsaw. architecture <laughs> Yeah, so that is actually designed by one of the two designers of both CV and also Star Scrappers Cave In that we've Star talked Scrappers. about a few times. So I'm really excited. I mean, I have really enjoyed Star Scrappers. I hear great things about CV, and obviously, this is another game that is on our radar super high. I want to talk about a game that will not be available for purchase, but is for demo, coming from Osprey Games, and this is called Cryptid. And I will be completely honest, this game is high on my list specifically because of the cover. This is a game with art by Quan Shai Moria, and this is a deduction game with a modular board. And usually you hear deduction game and you're like, mm, I don't know if I really want to do that because you're always, you know, lying and doing all this stuff. But the deduction That's in this one... social deduction, my yeah, friend. The deduction in this one was not so much a social deduction or a, you know, lie about your role kind of thing, but you're trying to gather information from the other players while also also misleading them from your particular information. This is a game about a group of cryptozoologists who are coming together to share their notes to uncover some magical, mythical creature of some kind. And through the way that the game works, you're going to be sharing your information, but hopefully not sharing all of the information, so you're the only one that really knows the true nature of this particular cryptid. And obviously, it's super enhanced by Quan Chai Moria's amazing art. The box cover... Good art. Just like, this is a box cover I want on my shelf. And also, I trust it because Osprey Games has done such a great job with their games catalog in the last year or two. We've seen a lot of really cool stuff, both recently prints and new games coming from Osprey that this is super high up on my list of things to check out at Gen Con. I wouldn't be surprised if you were a little bit more excited about this because of one real play podcast about <laughs> cryptids currently. Yeah. But it, it it absolutely does look really interesting. I also had this on my list because of the deduction. I don't like social deduction at all, but I really do like deductive games that are hard deduction. And this sounds like it is a deduction game where you are not necessarily trying to lie to the other players, but you're trying to be just vague enough that you get the information you want without giving everything away. And that seemed really interesting to me as a sort of a different kind of take on deduction. Mm -hmm. I am going to be very, very excited to see One Deck Galaxy, which is coming out. It is going to be demoed. I don't believe it is going to be available, but it is coming out from Asmati Games, just like One Deck Dungeon was and the One Deck Dungeon expansion were. It looks like it is a similar sort of mechanic where instead of fighting monsters in a dungeon, you are exploring locations in space. 
normally adding space to things doesn't really get me jazzed about them, but I really did enjoy One Deck Dungeon and the One Deck Dungeon expansion, so I'm excited to see if they change it at all when they go into space with this, and if there are five awesome space ladies with which you can take on these space locations. <laughs> I have, an, this, this is another one that I have a demo for, so I'm excited to see what's going on and what this game is going to bring to the forefront. I also secretly hope that they put it in as some DLC content for the app eventually. <laughs> that would be nice. That is well cart before the horse, I understand, because the game's not even out yet, but the app for that game is just absolutely phenomenal, or mm. the online implementation for that game, rather, is just absolutely phenomenal. So I'm always just excited to see more content for this that can then be funneled into that. <laughs> Yeah, if they add a space theme to a game and you're excited about it, that means it's something that I should put definitely put my eyes on. Yeah, space ain't my thing. <laughs> <laughs> so that sounds really cool. Um, I have a Queen game on my list, a game coming from Queen Games. Are you ill? I don't know yet, but this one is called Franchise, and it is specifically relevant to me because of the line of work I am in. I work for a franchise restaurant, and this is a game about developing franchise businesses during the 1960s United States. And I, look, that's really all I know. I'm 100% interested in this because of the theme. I hope that it's good. I also know that I'm glad that it's not for sale because I would probably pay and spend way too much money for it. It <laughs> will be $15 on Amazon by the end of the year, maybe. That's probably likely. <laughs> it looked like you could develop all sorts of different types of businesses in this game as well. It wasn't necessarily just restaurants, but yeah. it seemed like you could develop all kinds of businesses and try to grow them into larger franchise institutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just really interested by the concept. I'm hoping that it works well, and I'm hoping that it is somehow relevant to my work, because I would love to take this to a work function and share it with people, and they can learn about the way franchises works, and also I tricked everybody into playing a board game. I somehow i'm not gonna not hold gonna... my breath on that one <laughs> okay what else you got from formal ferret games yeah. i have high rise now this is a game about Ooh. constructing a high rise building and finding the proper tenants for it you can take favors in order to construct your building better or get better tenants i actually was just looking on twitter yesterday and Gilhova got 3d printed components for this that look absolutely so cool so i'm excited to see this new component upgrade for this game but i really like the idea of just trying to construct a tower and having the resources to construct the tower but also making sure that you can get the most influential tenants in there it's mm -hmm. really exciting and i always kind of give formal fare at the benefit of the doubt and it has not burned me yet so i'm hoping that that streak continues and i'm excited to see this one absolutely yeah you know we're big fans of the networks we already talked about that fans of wordsy Battle Merchants, and I'm just always excited to see a new game coming out from Gilhova's brain of cool game ideas. He's got cool themes, he's got cool games, and I always, like, I, like, I really enjoy getting a formal Ferret Games demo at Gen Con. That was one of the first demos we did in our very first Gen Con. We played Battle Merchants there. Mm -hmm. So it's fun to check in and hang out and play a game designed by Gilhova. So we'll be checking out High Rise on Sunday, yep. I believe. Up next on my list, I have a game from Pandasaurus Games that is actually for sale. This is a game called Minerva. It is a game of tile placement and city building designed by Hisashi Hayashi. This is obviously a kind of city building game. You're going to require resources. You're going to get some victory points. You're going to be placing tiles and building a city. I love a tile laying game, so this is you pretty do. pretty much guaranteed something that I'm at least going to walk by and take a look at, and I wouldn't be surprised if I pick it up. It looks cool, and I'm excited to see what uh, Hazashi Hayashi does it in a tile laying scenario. This was also on my list of stuff I was excited about, less so for the tile laying and more so for the city building, mm -hmm. but I, I believe this is really about the way you construct the lines in your city and you want to make sure that you build out lines that you can get the most out of before they are exhausted in their uses. I'm very excited about this game and I'm like like I like you said, I'm excited to see what they do with it. It didn't look like the art was super exciting. It's yeah. just your your standard like here's some Roman style art. Pieces. Here's some Roman. It's not bad in any stretch of the imagination from what I've seen, but it's, I mean, 
we talked about cryptid before being like, oh my god, the art. This is sort of like, oh, there's also some art. Yeah, oh, the good. art exists. And I remember what it is. So this one has the mechanic where after, as you were laying out your buildings, you have to place a living quarters at the end of the row, and then it activates that entire row, which means that if you're not paying attention, you could either have all of your stuff on one row, and then you've blocked it off with the living quarters on either end, and then you're just out of luck with that entire row. So you got to be really smart about the way you build your city out. That's what it was. That's why I'm interested in this. That is mm-hmm. a cool tile like mechanic. Got it. Minerva. <laughs> I would like to talk about the first of, oddly, two games about somebody in, like, really critical hospital care that's coming out at this Gen Con that look really interesting. Weird theming intersect. It is. um, That's not something I would have thought of seeing before. And then there's two at this Gen Con. But I'm talking about Holding on the Troubled Life of Billy Kerr, which is coming from Hub Games. It is going to be demoed there. From what I can tell, this is a scenario based game where you're going to play a replayable scenario each time. And it is about the story of this man who had a massive heart attack on a flight from Sydney to London. And he has apparently some questionable past and you are playing the nursing staff who's trying to make sure that he is well cared for but is also trying to reconnect him with the memories that he has and his past situation so he can write his regrets in the past Um, i'm excited to see how they handle this really more than anything like the mechanics of it will be interesting to learn but i want to see how they handle this because it is such a unique topic and i say unique knowing that there is another game about somebody being in a coma on this list which i'm sure we'll talk about in a minute but it is it is just an interesting game and i want to see mostly how they handle it mm-hmm. yeah it is interesting and i guess i'll just jump right into it the other one is coma knots coming from plaid hat games this is designed by jerry hawthorne and this is in his adventure book system following stuffed fables that came out late last year stuffed fables was an adventure campaign game that took place in this storybook of i think it was like a hundred different pages or so that you're working through this longer campaign ish story and that was obviously intended to be played with families and kids now coma knots is intended for a m- more mature audience as you are was coma the giveaway yeah i mean you're you're basically going <laughs> into the mind of this doctor who was in a coma. He invented this ring that malfunctioned and the Mobius ring has created a singularity. It's going to consume the world and you have to go into his mind to get the memories out of his coma or get him out of his coma or something along those lines. So I, he can make that not happen. So he can make think. that not happen because that's thing. that thing is a bad thing and we don't want it to happen. No. But yeah, so this is going to go, you're going to follow his inner child across 11 different coma zones and locate and overcome the inner demons that are holding the Doctor hostage. That is the the theme of this game. So, again, it is in that storybook, adventure book system, but obviously in a more mature kind of setting. Yeah, definitely. So I don't know a whole lot more about that other than this. This was just kind of the information released in the last week or so, but that is Comanauts. You can check that out over at the Plat Hat Games table. Well, to continue the idea of sort of heavy themes and adult games, I'd like to talk about guerrilla marketing. I knew this was coming. (laughs) Gorillas are heavy, so I mean, gorillas are heavy. Bananas are also heavy if you have a lot of them. (laughs) In guerrilla marketing, the idea is that the the head of this marketing firm decided that his executives were so dumb that gorillas were smarter than they were, so he fired them all and hired a bunch of gorillas. Mm -hmm. And in this game, it it plays in two phases. And you have these dice, and you're going to roll an acronym at the beginning of the first phase. And whatever the category is that you are working in, maybe maybe like Western movie or whatever, and you're going to have to come up with the name of this particular product that fits that acronym. And then in the second phase, you're going to roll another acronym, and you're going to have to come up with the marketing slogan that fits that particular acronym. And then all the, the answers are turned into the person judging the round, And they are going to judge it based on a specific criteria that may be sort of off the wall, to say the least. You know, I think the example that they gave in the rundown is like, which of these would have the closest close up? And uh, they will judge whichever of the sets of acronyms is the best for that particular category. And that person will receive many bananas because they are gorillas. And that is the way that gorillas receive points. Yeah, I'm really excited about this. And Roxley does a great job with their production. So I'm sure it's going to come out to be an awesome looking game. And hopefully as fun as it sounds. Uh, yeah, gor- it sounds like a fun goofy party game. Gorilla marketing. Very <laughs> excited. All right, Danielle, am I going to talk about Star Trek or not Star Trek right now? Let's talk about Star Trek. Okay, so whiz kids, you got me. You got me on this one. Mm. Star Trek Galactic Enterprises, an auction and bidding game. 
about Ferengi trading stuff. <laughs> Of course. Uh, I'm in. Okay, three to eight players. It's going to be 25 bucks, and this is just uh, straight up a game of wheeling and dealing, uh, legal and illegal items, in order to accrue the most profit, because as you know, a Ferengi without profit is no Ferengi at all. That is rule of acquisition number 18. This is the proof that if you put Star Trek on something, Jake has a 50-50 chance of buying it. Yeah. Well, I successfully avoided five-year missions, so Whew. I am willing to give a shot at this one. Um, because why not? I like to be Ferengi game sometime. Sometime. Sometime Ferengi game. It's best to be a Ferengi when you can stop being a Ferengi when the game is over. Very true. Now, Oink has a couple of games that they're bringing to Gen Con this year. Uh, one of them I'm very excited about, one of them I'm sort of meh on, and the other one you're very excited about, and I just shake my head out when I see it. Very well. The one I'm very excited about, and I think you actually were pretty jazzed about too, is yes. Toma Tomato, which is a silly little game where you're playing down cards that have either like To, Toma, Tomato, or Tomato, I th- or Tomato. Mato, just straight oh, Mato. Just Mato. Yeah. And you're playing them out in sequence, and then the person, once they've played a card, has to say the whole long string of things, and if you say it correctly, then you get to keep playing. And I'm really excited about this, because it just seems stupid. Yes. <laughs> like, I want to sit there and play this at the end of a game night at, you know, Salud Cerveceria, where we've just been playing a bunch of games on the big tables, having a bunch of beers, maybe you're sitting down having your tea before you go because they have very good tea there and you're just like oh, okay it's 10 30 at night it's a week night i have been doing stuff all day let me say tomato a bunch of really different <laughs> weird ways like i see this being a really good goofy game yeah you say tomato i say tomato toma tomato ma mama of course yeah. <laughs> that was a pretty good one the next one um in that set is the one that i am weirdly interested in it is called void and apparently there's going to be just a very few copies of this game but it is not well okay so it's in the description it says this is a work of art created for the quote is this a game unquote exhibition held in the akibahara sector of tokyo from may 29th to june 3rd 2018 it is a box of a bunch of weird tiles and dice and a marker but no rules at all on how to use these components to play a game except for the rules saying use these components as you wish to make a game and then post them to social media and whoever gets the most likes wins what you're the one who likes it man i just shake my head at this like i i like this because it's so weird i love it i love it when people are taking interesting weird chances and they're taking weird chances in a very small box kind of thing this isn't the giant statement that something like 504 is, for example. 504 obviously had rules and frameworks and all this stuff to create games, but this, like, if you want to get really artsy-fartsy about it, you can kind of look at this and say, okay, so is this a game? Is there a game in this box? And is this trying to make a greater statement on what gaming is? I am, and this is going really deep into stuff we've talked about in other episodes, I am really interested to see what happens in board gaming in the next five to ten years to take it into spaces that we've seen video games and other forms of media go into that are challenging the concept of what a game really is. You know, we talk a lot about walking simulators in video games, not so much on the podcast, but in real life. We have things like What Reigns of Edith Finch or Gone Home or even the, uh, what is it, the Stanley Parable, things like that, that are really challenging what gaming is. And obviously, this is not a walking simulator. This is a box of random stuff saying, okay, well, you know, isn't a game just a competition in a way? So this is a competition about getting social media likes, but we're going to do it with these game components. So while the execution in terms of it being a big statement on gaming might not be there, it might not be all there, the fact that Oink Games, who does a lot of oddities, you know, here and there, but for the most part have always just been kind of these little box games, that they're taking the chance to step out and say, okay, well, we're going to try something really off the wall, and we're going to see if this one works in the context of gaming in an art statement kind of form. Did that make any sense, or did I just ramble for too long? I mean, it does make sense, and I applaud you for thinking about it on that sort of concept level. But I'm thinking about it on the fact that Oink Games cost $22 in the United <laughs> States, and you're paying $22 
for a small box of office supplies and a popularity contest on social media, which I try to avoid in my everyday life. <laughs> so I'm not really on board with Void. I, I see what you're saying, and that was a great discussion you just had. I don't need to pay the $22 to have had that discussion. Though. Mm, would you pay $20 for a piece of art, though? No, but maybe popsicle sticks. Okay, fine. That was 50 bucks. We'll move on. I know. The, f <laughs> the final Oink game that they are bringing that's new is called Zogan. And this is a game where you are playing cards that have one of four or have combinations of four different little microbe looking at little creatures. And when you play a card out, you need to have either one more or one less than the card that was played before, I believe the, is the way it works. So that you're constantly keeping track of what is on your cards and what is on the center pile and making sure that you can adapt to what has been played so that you can play a card from your hand. I think it's interesting and neat. I'm not necessarily sure I'm, I want to buy that one. Like I said, Oink games are a little pricey sometimes for the amount of cards that you're getting or the amount of game that you're getting, especially something at, with uh, a game as light as Zogan sounds like it is, but it is interesting, and I want to see how it plays. I want I want to see if the flow really goes there, or if everybody just sits at their cards and stares and <laughs> tries to very methodically play a card. If it's that sort of quick, fun game, then it might be worth it. But if it's just sort of an activity in looking at things, I don't need it. <laughs> A few items that I have in the, this is a very small box, so it's silly for me to not pick this thing up that I'm interested in. First, I have Peep Mots coming from Lookout Games. Birds. This is a card game, 15 bucks, uh, two to four players, and has cute pictures of birds. And birds are cute, so I'm going to get that game. That is literally <laughs> my entire reasoning for it. Um, I, I also... mean, Lookout generally <laughs> makes good games as yes. well. I've, I've found some good stuff from Lookout before. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so <laughs> I'm looking at the, the info here, and here are some of the words that I got to read just now. Uh, resolve effects step. Compare the birds on the ground with the birds at the perch. <laughs> so we're getting that. And then I can take a seed card or add a bird to my collection and move a bird to the feeder. This is the best game I have ever seen birds. I'm getting it. Uh, the other one is Quinto. This is a roll and write game coming from Pandasaurus Games. I'm really excited that this is finally getting over here. This game actually came out in 2015, but this is the first U.S. release of it. This is a similar, kind of like a brother of Quix, if you remember that one. One of the very first roll and writes that kind of got over here and started getting everybody all hyped up along with uh, the Roll in America series. It's that kind of flip-top box from what I understand, and this is just very similar to Quix. A roll a bunch of colored dice, and you're going to select some for your particular uh, your particular color sheet, and you have to fill in all or as many of the circles as you can. So I'm going to probably grab that because roll and writes are cool. From what I can tell, this is the slightly more complicated older brother. Yeah. Um, it there is there is a little bit more restriction on how you fill in those rows. So if Quix was sort of the level you wanted your roll and writes on, maybe Quinto's not the game for you. But if you played Quix and you're like, okay, what's next? Then Quinto is the kind of thing that you may very well be excited by. Probably the biggest box that I expect to come home with is a game called The Rise of Queensdale. This is coming from Alea Ravensburger. And this is Ravensburger and uh, Inca and Marcus Brand taking a stab at a legacy game. This is the traditional Euro-ish feel, and it looks like they're going to make that particular world into a legacy style game where you are tr processing resources, collecting raw materials, building buildings, developing your particular village. I am interested to see it. I'm hoping that it looks as good as it seems on paper. And, you know, they're obviously going to have some demos of it. It's kind of the big thing that they've got coming this year. And I am excited to see more of these campaign and or legacy style games coming out. Again, I'm looking for games that are doing something more than giving me the two hour Euro experience. I want to see development and I want to see growth. Um, and I'm really, really, I hate to say this, but I'm hoping this does what I wanted like Seafall to do and give mm, me a civilization to grow. Suck. Yeah, I mean, I want to I want to have a legacy style game that is easy to jump back into and compels me to get back in and have fun with it. That's kind of how we're feeling about Charterstone right now. You know, mm -hmm. the the twists are coming in such a way that it makes us excited to get back in. So I'm ex I'm hoping that Rise of Queensdale does that in the more classical Euro setting and feel. I 
think there's going to be a lot of eyes on this game running through the end of the year and early into yet next year as people are finishing up their campaigns as to whether or not Legacy is going to be a viable thing or if it's just a, a lucky fluke that's every now and then works out okay. We'll have to see. The other one that is up on my top things to look at list. This is something I actually had a chance to play last year at Gen Con. This is Super Wits and Wagers, Superheroes mm -hmm. versus Supervillains. It is obviously a spin on the Wits and Wagers series, but you are playing in teams and the, each of the characters that you have is going to have special superpowers that manipulate the way that the bets work. Wits and Wagers, uh, for those of you who have not played it, is a game where you have a question come up and everybody's going to write on their personal sheet what number they think it is, and then you're going to place wagers on who you think is right. So it's a trivia game that doesn't rely on you being right to win. But I was really interested to see the way that the powers for each of the villains and heroes affected the way that the betting works. You know, they had an opportunity to manipulate the bets and move some tiles around, maybe destroy somebody's tile for that particular round. So it was a really interesting take on the Wits and Wagers um, framework, and I'm hoping that this one is continuing to get a good bit of development and turn out to be a pretty cool thing. Yeah, super Wits and Wagers. You can probably get a demo of that this year at Gen Con, coming from North Star Games. One thing I'm curious to see how this actually works as a game is Fortune City. Fortune City is a city building game, but it is based on an app which was actually a money management app. Because I looked at this when I was going through the preview and I was like, oh, based on the app. I was like, oh, let me check out the app to see what this is because I love a city building game. That'll be fun. And I downloaded it and it's like log your purchases and then you build buildings based on what you've purchased. Really? So I'm yeah, it's it's sort of just a money hmm. tracker, and depending on what you buy, it builds different kinds of buildings, and you can put different people to work in it. It's gamification of keeping a budget. So I'm curious to see if the Fortune City board game is just a city building game, which is what I thought the, the app would have been originally, or if they somehow tie in this sort of spending areas and sort of categories of spending to make this city building game. If they do something interesting on a city building game that has to do with that initial source i'd be curious to see what it is i'm not necessarily gonna like champion this game be like oh you must run out and buy it the second it becomes available but i'm curious to see how they take that weird source material mm. and make it into a game or if they just make it straightforward into a city builder that's really interesting i'd like to see that and see how that works at all it looks like it's kind of a small box deal too it's uh, 35 bucks so plays two to four players in half an hour to 45 minutes so I, it's a, an interesting concept, and I'm interested to see how that translates to a board game. I'm also excited to see Symphony Number no. 9, mm -hmm. where you are a wealthy patron of the arts in the 18th century, and you are donating cubes to these composers, and as you gain their works, it's going to take cubes off of their life track, and then when they die, when all the cubes off their track is gone, depending on how major a patron you were, you're going to get different amounts of points. So I, it just mostly was a neat theme to me. I You don't often see classical music patronage as your theme for a board game. I mean, I guess Shakespeare was about classical theater patronage, but I'm curious to see how Symphony Number no. 9 takes this and moves it to the idea of classical music patronage. Also, the idea that as you are putting more of your cubes into this particular composer's track to gain their noble works, you're also speeding up the rate at which they're going to score. I think that'll create an interesting sort of push and pull. Like you want to be able to put more things into a whole bunch of composers, but you don't want somebody else to be able to finish off that track and edge you out for that majority. I'm interested to see how it plays. Yeah, it sounds like a really interesting theme as well. I'm always up to see a new kind of theme come into board games. Uh, for a completely unnew theme, I have a space game. Mm, I know, what a surprise. Uh, this is coming from a publisher I did not expect to ever want to see something from, and not because I don't think they're a good publisher, it's just not really my style. Peterson Games, uh, most known oh, for wow. Cthulhu Wars, you know, giant minis, Cthulhu, all this stuff. Has not nearly the giantest Cthulhu mini. Yeah, though. really. They, had, they, they really did that just probably to stick it to Cthulhu Wars, didn't they? Uh, maybe. All right, anyway, uh, this game that I'm talking about is Hyperspace. This is obviously designed by Sandy Peterson, and it looks like it is 
a space civ building game. Uh, it plays two to six players once you get expansions, and it's a two to four player asymmetric strategy game about interstellar expo- expansion. Um, I don't know a whole lot about it other than that it's Peterson Games, it's going to be very asymmetric, and it's going to be about space 4Xing. So I'm really interested to see what this game is, because I would love another really good space 4X game. I like Star Trek Ascendancy. It's not really a 4X game 100% of the way, and I am terrified of Eclipse right now, because it is very, (laughs) very, very big. So hopefully this game is not as big and is also interesting to play. I also am interested to take a look at Neon Gods coming from Plaid Hat Games. Now, this is apparently a remake of City of Remnants, which was one of Plaid Hat Games and Isaac Vega's first designs. And this is a story of street gangs in a kaleidoscopic near future of heightened reality inspired by sci-fi cinema of the 70s and 80s. It looks freaking gorgeous. This is one of those things that, like... I can always rely on Plaid Hat games to have amazing looking games. And for the most part, their stuff has really held up on the back end with the play experience as well. You know, I was a big fan of Spectre Ops, Dead of Winter, a lot of the games that they really made their bread and butter on. We played through Ashes a good bit and really enjoyed the way that that game plays as well. So I'm hoping that they've done some cool things to City of Remnants to make this game Neon Gods. And it will apparently be visible for demo, so hopefully I can get a demo game in or at least, you know, hover over somebody demoing a game. It's really hard to get a game at Plaid Hat sometimes because they do bring a lot of eyes to their tables. I mean, if it's neon, one would hope that you would be bringing eyes in. That should be very (laughs) eye-catching on the table. Yes. I'm excited to see Infamous, which is coming from Eagle Griffin. This is a game where you are an evil mastermind and you are building your lair, but the rooms that you put into your lair attract different henchmen, and then once you've attracted the henchmen, you're assigning them out to complete different jobs. So it's got a little bit of that high-rise and a little bit of the big score feel. If you put those two things together, that's how I'm imagining this game. I'm kind of curious to see if that is actually what it's going to be. Now, it had said that it was sort of based on a a comic book, which I'm not familiar with, and that generally, like, I don't know if not knowing the source material is going to be a matter, but I'm curious to see because I'm excited about the two things that it sort of seems in my head like it combines. So I'm going to check out when I'm at Eagle Griffin's table hovering over escape plan to try and make sure that that is the awesomeness that I am pretty sure that it is. I'm going to have to check out Infamous as well. Cool. All right. Very final game that I want to discuss, and this is kind of a big one. I'm honestly kind of surprised it didn't come up sooner. Uh, coming from Big G Creative, I have Monster Crunch, the breakfast battle game. I'm not what? joking. This is a game sponsored by General Mills about the breakfast cereal villains or characters. I don't know, the Count is on there, and it looks like the Ghost from Boo Berry, and that's definitely Frankenberry. But anyway, uh, this is a game of luck and strategy where you're collecting cereal cards in your bowls, and each monster has special powers to give you an advantage and help you gobble up the most cereal, use milk tokens to combine cereal cards and take bigger bites. The monster cereal character that munches the most wins the game. This sounds like a game that was created solely because sales of cereal is going down. What are you trying to say? I like cereal. I'll eat more. Please, oh. please don't take away my Cinnamon Toast Crunch. Nobody's taking away your Cinnamon Toast Crunch. Chocolate peanut butter Cheerios are really freaking good. They are. I'm not going to disagree with you mm. on that. Peanut butter crunch, very good as well. Um, I was never really big on, like, the Count Chocula stuff. No, not really. We are running out of things to talk about on this hype list. Well, it wouldn't be a hype list without somebody dropping that last-minute edition. I'm actually recording this 9 a.m. on Monday, right before we release this episode, because Plaid Hat Games just announced Gen 7, a Crossroads game, which is the long-rumored-to-be-in-development Crossroads in Space game. Crossroads is a system that they used in Dead of Winter, where you have a deck of kind of criteria cards that one player has, and they're watching the previous player's turn to see if they meet certain criteria or if a certain thing happens, and it changes the way that the story dynamically unfolds. This one I doubt is going to be available for sale, and I'm hoping will at least be available for preview, but they do have it up for pre-order on their website, and the surprising things about this one, one, they are going with what is all the rage these days, is a campaign mode in which you are unlocking additional content. It looks like it's going to be seven games long, about an hour a game, and then two, the pre-order price on this is 100 bucks, which is way more expensive than I would have expected, considering they're 
doesn't seem to be a whole bunch of like miniatures components or crazy fancy componentry, but I'm guessing that there's going to be more unlockables than you can see in that particular initial component shot. But if you're interested in more information on that, we will probably be seeing it in the next few days. Hopefully we can swing by the Plat Hat Games booth and take a look at Gen 7, a Crossroads game, which apparently finally exists. Let's, hey, let's... if your favorite game wasn't here, I'm sorry, but these are our lists, and there is literally hundreds upon hundreds of games on the list, so I would love to hear your particular games that you are most excited about. You can come into our Slack channel and talk with us, and if you had been in our Slack channel in the last two weeks, maybe you would be taking part in this next final round segment. So, uh, let's move on to that. This DraftMechanic.net is being recorded for quality assurance purposes. Please stay on the line and someone will be with you shortly. Okay, it is time for the final round in which we ask our Slack channel uh, their thoughts on a specific topic. If you are interested in jumping in on the final round in the future, come join our Slack. It's DraftMechanic.net slash Slack. It's free to join, real easy to use. Slack is a very simple app for your smartphone that allows you to chat about board games and other things in this and other Slack channels. So, the topic this time was... In what is likely the easiest final round topic ever, it's time for hype. So, what's on your Gen Con hype list, and why? Daniel, you want to start us off? Sure. Eric Buscemi says, Haven from Red Raven Games, and City of Gears from Grey Fox. Also, if you like abstract tetromino puzzle games, check out Scarabia from Bruno Cathala and Blue Orange. I got a review copy, and I've been playing it a lot and really liking it. Yeah, I don't know a whole lot about that game, but Tetrominoes and quick and easy playing Bruno Cathala seems like a good idea. So that might be something that sneaks onto my uh, games to playlist. We'll have to check it out. So Paul Imboden says, For RPGs, Scum and Villainy jams every scoundrel science fiction trope in one RPG system. Easiest system to GM in ages, along with Blades in the Dark. Insanely fun, no fancy dice required, just some D6s. More and greater replay for $35 than 99% of board games out there. For board games, however, it's a Kickstarter getting released at Gen Con, the undertow expansion for Too Many Bones. The most over-the-top Rococo game on the market just got more so. Ticks off every turn-based tactical fighting video game thing that I love, cuts out the chaff I don't, and it, it plays great solo. Jeff Ebner said, Really looking forward to Root and Founders of Gloomhaven. Would love to get in a demo of Escape Plan as well. I'm into that. Yeah, you and me too. BJ from Board Game Gumbo says 436 titles later. I'm guessing he got to that list kind of early. Must have. I'm keen on checking out the new Downforce track, Must Buy, Gizmos, Must Buy, and Trading on the Tigress, Must Buy. I'm also really interested in Queenbra, Spring Meadow, Reef, and Villainous. As for demos, if I have time, I want to check out City of Gears. That'll be easy since I'm working at the booth. The new Imperial Settlers Amazons expansion, as well as the Imhotep expansion. See how the progress is coming on Legends of Sleepy Hollow and Fireball Island. And sneak some peeks at High Rise, The Estates, and the new Adrenaline expansion. Wish me luck. You're going to you're gonna need it, BJ. That is a big old list. It is. John Tyler says, FYI, Reef is an awesome short game. Picked it up at Origins. Also looking forward to Coimbra, City of Gears, Forbidden Sky, and the Imhotep expansion, even though we're not going to Gen Con. Cry. Well, don't fret, John. As it is in gaming, all of these games will undoubtedly be at your friendly local gaming store, probably in the near future. But yeah, I'm really excited to get to Gen Con this week, see all the new hotness and the crazy stuff going on, meet up with a whole bunch of people like we do every year at Gen Con. We will be recording our recaps at the end of every day, releasing that in the special episode the Monday after Gen Con, so a week from this one's release today. So you can check that out and hear about all the experiences and games we saw. Yep, if you've listened to any of our previous Gen Con recap episodes, it'll be Jake and myself and Shane again. He has been in the previous at least two recap episodes that we've done, and he may be able to give you some opinions on some kids' games, because he actually has some kids. Yeah, we've got a meeting set up with Haba, so hopefully we'll get to see some coolness there. Cool. All right, well, this brings us to the end of the episode. If you're looking for us on the internet, draftmechanic.net is the place to go, at Draft Mechanic, on the social media of Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Or you can shoot us an email at draftmechanic at gmail.com, or join our Slack at draftmechanic.net slash slack. 
We've also got a Board Game Geek Guild. That is guild number 2470. There will be a thread up for this, so you can let us know what you're excited about for Gen Con. And if you are in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, or in the area around the Carolinas, we really encourage you to come out to our Great Bid Board Game Day, Sunday, August 12th, at Good Road Cider Works from noon until close around 7 o'clock. Come out, play some games, have some cider, some beer, some food, some fun. we got some prizes, some raffle prizes we're going to give away as well, and uh, hopefully some more. We're trying to set up some other fun things to do on that particular particular day. It's going to be a great time. Mm -hmm. There's information on our website and also on our Facebook page if you want to RSVP to that. It'd be really nice if you RSVP to that because then I would have a vague idea of who all's or how many people are going to be showing up for it. Draft Mechanic is sponsored by Gray Fox Games. Visit grayfoxgames.com and sign up for their newsletter for the latest. Gray Fox Games, quality games, cleverly crafted. All right. I think we have pretty much said everything we need to say, except Daniel. I feel like you have a few words of wisdom, as you usually do at this time. As always, I would like to remind our listeners to please game responsibly and tell them that I'll see them back here in one week for the Gen Con recap and another round. All right. Good night, everybody. Night. Draft Mechanic Episode 80 was recorded on Sunday, July 29th, 2018 in front of a live studio cast. stricken do not go gently into that gutter line. hey board gamers bj from board game gumbo here back with more louisiana flavor tornado mission we love talking board games that's why we started up gumbo live the number one facebook live talk show dedicated to board gaming each week we interview guests from your hobby publishers designers content creators and you get to ask them whatever you like it's a live show so join us at board game gumbo on facebook every tuesday night at 8 30 p.m central for another episode of gumbo live and until next time les et les bon temps roulé punchboard media where we all bring something to the table pull up a chair at punchboardmedia.com <laughs>